I'll call the um, March 25th uh, Newport Beach City Council study session to order. May we have the roll call, please? The record will show that all council members are present. Okay, first item is clarification of items on the consent calendar. Uh, Councilwoman Gardner? Nothing. Councilman Curry? Nothing. Councilman Webb? Nothing. Councilman Hen? Yes, on item nine regarding Marina Park, I just want to clarify, will, will this funding take us all the way through to the point of readiness for final designs? In other words, this takes us all the way up to the point where we've got construction drawings ready to be made. Yeah, this, well actually this takes us to the beginning of design development. So this is the schematic design phase, then there'll be a more intensive design development process and then the actual production of construction bid documents. Actually, as a follow-up to that, because since we are going to be starting the design drawings or design work, and I know we had a presentation on this uh, about the conceptual plan, but I, I thought there was still some more talk about maybe reconfiguring the size, and I'm not talking about the height, but the actual size of the buildings. I mean, are we still talking about that? Are we going to see a final, a final, final plan, or before we go that far? Um. Well, we could always bring it back to the uh, back to the full city council. I don't think there's anything to uh, change any of the size uh, requirements of the either the sailing center or the community center so at this the, point. It's so just mainly to reduce the height of so the, the footprints uh, and the square yes. footages. Or there's no plans to change any of that anymore. Not at this time, no. Okay. Okay, uh, Councilmember Rosansky. None, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Daigle. Uh, none, thanks. Okay, and I have none. Mayor? Yes. Um, regarding um, number three on the consent calendar, the kennel ordinance, um, the police department has been working with the um, person, Mr. Tanzer, that appeared at the last meeting, and it appears as though we probably need to make some changes to the ordinance to accommodate the type of uh, facility that they operate, and uh, we haven't been able to make those changes quickly enough to get it on tonight's agenda. So. In order to give us some more time to work with it, we probably will be requesting that that item be pulled and continued to the second meeting in April. And that gives us more time to work with Mr. Tanzer and the kennel community. Okay. Any other staff comments on the consent calendar? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to our uh, first discussion item, which is the presentation of the Sunset Ridge Park concept plans. Mr. Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, we are here tonight to bring to you the reaction to the draft concept plan for Sunset Ridge Park. Beginning in November of 07, we started conducting outreach in the West Newport area regarding this, this park and its concept design, which is consistent with the general plan. The general plan calls for Sunset Ridge to be an active sports park and contain certain elements, athletic fields, parking lot, restroom, tot lot, walkways, vistas, and so forth. That is in your agenda packet. As we moved through the outreach program, we conducted four meetings. Beginning in November, working with the PBNR Commission, we had an outreach meeting. We had park development in January, another outreach meeting in February, and then earlier this month, the PBNR Full Commission saw it. So this plan has been put forward to the community and the residents four different times in preparation for coming back to you tonight to report in and present to you and give reaction to it. I'm just going to summarize before I answer any questions and then turn it over to the consultant, uh, which has been with us throughout this EPT with Rick Vanderwood and staff, Carrie and Nathan, uh, and, and they will then present that. Then you can ask questions of them and then get to the residents. Uh, I will say that through the outreach program, working with the residents, particularly Newport Crest, and, and some of them you will hear from tonight. I feel that it has been a cooperative effort where people were really listening to one another. We don't agree. There's competing interests. There's youth sports, primarily soccer and baseball, and then there are those who live near the park. But I must say that I, I feel that it's been a very honest and open process, and I have to thank Councilmember Rosansky and PBNR Commissioner Tim Brown for their efforts being out on site, making home visits and all kinds of things. So we come to you, I think, fully prepared to report back on what your plan has, has been received like when it's been out in the community. Um, I will say that there is a lot of concern, and that's in your agenda report too. 
I think that those things can be addressed, but after tonight, we will we'll seek direction from you. That is, is sort of an open-ended recommendation that's in the agenda report. And we will move forward trying to achieve a final concept plan, and hopefully we'll get that done early this summer. But whatever it takes, we'll keep working on it and uh, bring back to the council what it takes to get it done. So with that, I'll answer any questions if you have any. If not, I can turn it over and we can see the presentation and go from there. Any questions of Wes? Mike? Just a quick question. Uh, has the plan evolved at all as a result of public input, or is that is that the threshold that we're at now? That's where we're at tonight. Okay. Uh, during the four meetings, it came out that, well, are we going to change this? When are we going to change it? I felt we needed to honor the general plan. We needed to honor the council's place in this to be the one to provide direction to change what the general plan called for. And so we're here tonight to present that and get your reaction to it. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, Rick? Rick Vanderwood from EPT has been with us. We'll, uh, it, it's brief. It's in your pack. It's probably about 12. Well, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here to present to you tonight the park we've been working very closely with the staff on for many months now here. And as Wes mentioned, many presentations. And, and so I'll take you through our, our uh, analysis first and take you the process to where we are today with the park design. Um, we've been on the site several times. Um, taking a close look at things, photographing, getting a good sense of the, the site and the, the constraints and opportunities that are there that we have to work within. Um, and the, the, the site in general is pretty much a pie-shaped uh, lot to work with here, which um, we just see how it kind of works with the design here, but it's kind of a pie-shaped type of lot here we have to work within. We have some extensive slopes along the edge here, along Superior and along Pacific Coast Highway that form the edge here that kind of pushes into the area, into the site here, constraints there. We have a, an interior slope along here, about 30 or 40 foot high slope along here that uh, breaks the two areas into a lower and, and a higher area through here. We have a major slope on adjacent development here um, that um, the builder owns here, the adjacent builder owns. Um, we have vehicle access which is going to take place um, through this adjacent piece of property here. The city's been working with the adjacent landowner here to get access to bring us into our park from this side here, so that kind of dictates our entry to the park as far as vehicular access goes. <clears throat> we have some um, storm drain easements to work with here. It cuts through the park here. We have a series of it. It's here to, to, uh, to honor, take, uh, take care of that. But the biggest kind of impact on the site that kind of sets the park of the design we took, that you'll see tonight, is the scenic easement, an agreement that was put together with Caltrans and the city when they bought the property that nothing in this area could be, no, no hard fixed items could be built in this area, like a parking lot, a building, or walls, or, or a backstops for major baseball fields could not be built in this area here. So that kind of sets the, uh, the parameters of kind of park, the major element of the park is going to have to take place in, up through here, as you'll see in the design as we come along here. Also, we had we been along the edge of the property here where the homes are along here. We've looked, we've walked the site many times, look at the views across here. They have fantastic views across the site, across the city to the ocean. And so we want to honor those and try to protect those views in the design of the park. It's very important to us in the design approach here. <clears throat> With that, let's go to the next one here. Um, so the park is, uh, I want to remind you again, this is that easement line that I talked about that kind of sets the, the program to be um, the most active and biggest part of the program to be set in this area of the park here, this easement put in place here. As you come to the park, vehicle access takes here from the, from the west into the park, into a parking lot sitting in this area right through here. We have a restroom building, a, a children's play area, shade structure, and we have a, a, a baseball field as you see located here with backstops that come out right to this edge right here, just pushing right up against the easement here. We can't go further than that, so the baseball field has to take place right in here. <clears throat> we also have a large soccer field and a smaller soccer field the green open space you see through here. Um, in looking at the park here, so this is a very active part of the park, and this is more of the more passive part of the park. What we've done here is this major slope that I mentioned earlier here that takes place. We're going to take this slope and just push it way back and create some terraces going up this upper level here, soften the park edge right here, open up some more view potential across from these homes out this way by taking this slope and pushing it back. We'll have a, a mid couple uh, level gardens here as you, as you meander, your way up, meander your way up to the upper level. We'll have a shade structure up here, a view area sit up here and enjoy the view out to the ocean from this point here. <clears throat> we have several pedestrian entries into the park. One up here, the upper part of Spear comes in through here, into the upper garden here. Work your way down through the meandering walks that go through the park as you see here. We have an intermediate uh, 
walk that comes in off Superior, up through here, into the walk system. And then down at the corner here, where we'll have a, a park sign to, uh, for the park, we also have a set of steps to take you up from here. So people come across here and over here, can come to the park rather quickly from here or from the parking lot even. We had a, we, we also added, as I mentioned earlier, this, this walk in here, so people who don't want to walk the steps, want to walk on a more uh, you know, level area, they come up to here, walk across here, transition to the park. <clears throat> we also have another uh, walk that comes from the west here into the park, across the adjacent property and through here, into our circulation system in the park here. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned earlier, we're concerned about the views of the homes along here. So the next set of slides will show you some sections we cut through from each of these residences here to show you how the, the when they stand to their first floor balcony as they look across the park, we'll just see how that works. So let's go to the first Could, slide. could you show where the Westerly property line is? Go back Westerly to the property line? Let's go back. Exactly. Here. Sure. <clears throat> Westerly, proper, Westerly property line is long here. Now, is that the property line, or is there was an uh, originally an easement? That's the property line right there. Okay, so that right there, yeah. this is the, the extension of this line is not the property line. No, no, it jogs back here a bit and down like that. That's the property line there. So we have okay. a very large slope here um, to deal with here that what we want to soften here. We, uh, so, so how are you getting the uh, the uh, the pedestrian way? Uh, westerly of the property is that another agreement that's being worked on in addition to the vehicular access? Yes, yes. Okay. 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 Go ahead. Okay. Oh yeah, we have also a blow up of the, the very active area here to kind of be, show the relationship of these areas to the homes. The condos are up along this edge here. There's the property line right there. The backside of the parking lot is about 50 feet from the property line right here. <laughs> the the baseball field. Uh, fence is about 100 feet from the property line here. And one reason the tot lot is put back in this area is, is to keep the, the, the tot lot out of the, the foul ball area. We couldn't put it in this area because you got foul ball concerns here, so we put it behind the backstop so it's protected from foul balls. That's why it sits back in this area right here. That's the restroom and get the parking lot. <coughs> okay, let's go to the sections. Okay, we have five sections from each of the, the, the complexes along, the, along the, the north side of the property here. We cut some sections here as you can see. And they stand on their balcony with their ceiling looking across the park here. First one, Carrie. <clears throat> Section A, here's, here's the homes back here. Standing at their first uh, deck right here. This is the sight line across the park out towards the ocean here. Keeping low profile horizontal type trees, the grade falls away. This is across the parking lot on out towards the ocean here. So you have a very line, clear line of sight in this particular situation right here from these buildings right here looking straight out in this situation situation here. Approximately what elevation is your line of sight? Well, it's, it's about, uh, that's 55.5, that's another 10 feet up, so that puts that uh, 65 in relation to down here. Because it, your play field's in is 14. about 45 or so? Yes. Yes. Okay. This uh, area here is across the ball diamond. See, we're looking for the, the first story deck here across out to the ocean here. This is a concern with us, certainly understand from the adjacent homeowners here because we're looking, the backstop here would be 30 feet high. It's a standard backstop for the city here. Um, chain leak fabric, uh, about six poles along this edge. If you're looking across, so you can see they're looking through the top portion of this ball diamond here, the, the backstop here, which is a concern we share with them. Um, so what we what we propose to do there, the city recently has done a park the next slide, carry that uh, has modified this type of backstop you see here. The lower portion of the backstop is 10 feet. The upper, the other 20 feet um, is a, they have, they go up to a, a kind of a <laughs> nylon mess fabric that you can kind of, you can see see through, uh, not bits of the screen as you would have with chain link fabric. You normally have like about six poles here. We have three poles, the nylon mesh looking through uh, to the ocean. So it, it doesn't, become a hard element as a, as a regular chain link fence would be. That's proposed to, to do that here to soften the impact of looking through the backstop in this area. <clears throat> again, you can see the green, the land falls away again. Okay. <clears throat> this is looking again um, through the outfield of the ball diamond. Um, you can see again a clear shot across the ball diamond out towards the ocean here from this unit here. This is the, this is the slope as we go up the next the upper terrace here. We're going to look at the next slide here. 
<clears throat> now, here again, looking out across the site, and you can see here, this is where we're lowering the grade substantially here, about 15 feet here as we take that slope and make it disappear and pull the grade back. And it drops quite a bit, so you get a lot more uh, view corridor from units down the way looking across towards, kind of towards the, I guess that would be the southwest area here. Um, so we we'll take quite a bit of dirt out of here and really soften this, this harsh area here. And this, these are, again, these are the um, garden areas, the terrace areas that go up to the upper area. Are you going to have any export or is it going to balance on site? We're going to have some export. Do you, do you have an idea of how much? Uh, no, no, unfortunately I don't. Our civil engineer is not here today. He probably would, but he's not here today. But uh, we will have some export, yes. <clears throat> and this is the very upper, the last section through here, across the deck, over the top of the shade structure out to the ocean here. Um, this is next, this is up by Superior. Basically, there's, there's Superior right here. There's that sound wall that's here right now, but that's Superior. This section is like right right through here, straight on out kind of thing. So that's that's the section across the site up there. Okay, let's go to that. So in, in designing the site, again, sharing the concerns of the views. We, we try to protect the views across the site. We also try to, to soften the impact of the site, you know, 97 percent of the site is still going to be green. You're going to have the parking lot area here and the top lot area here with some hardscaping here, but most of the site is going to be a green site with the walks that meandered through it. You have, we've taken the topography and uh, really softened it. We've, meand we've taken like these major slopes along here. We pulled them back a bit to repair them and soften the edge along here, not quite so steep. There's a very unsightly drainage ditch that goes along here, dumping into that. That's going to be removed and put underground so that unsightly ditch goes away there. Pull the slopes back here, pull the slope back here, soften the edges here. We've got some mounding occurring. And uh, again, we're, we're still lower than the houses up here. But we, did, we didn't raise the grade here. It always stays about the same. It's about what it is out there right now through here. We've got the site. This grade here will remain the same. We have a parking lot. We've got rounded edges and, and set up very rectangular, very soft rounded edges here. And we're going to take this slope here. We're, when we bring the track of the home, the vehicles through here, we're going to lay this slope back and soften this thing and plant this up here so it feels a lot different than what's out there today. So we've tried to um, make as much positive out of the park as we can. I think we have done a good job of that. And we also <laughs> got the program into the city water. We got the ball diamonds, the soccer fields, the parking lot, and the top lots and buildings. Again, this easement line is what's going to push the park to the major elements back in this area here. You show landscaping there that goes beyond the park's westerly boundary. Are we going to be doing landscaping outside the park boundary? Well, uh, uh, to some degree, probably where we enter in through here. I'm not sure. Um, we want to get a walk through here. We'll probably do some minor landscaping in here to kind of make this a pleasant walk through here. We really haven't uh, talked to the builder too much about what we do here, but they seem to be pretty open about um, able to do some things in their property. This space in, the, in their, their master plan is going to be open space. You know, they can't really build homes or anything in here, so this is going to be a natural open space in here. So working with the topography, planning it, and through here, uh, working with them, what we plan here will marry what they're planning on planning, planning here kind of thing. We'll make this work together. But that's still to be worked out how much landscape we do in here yet. <clears throat> Any other questions? Any other questions? This is a question from a non-baseball player. Okay. Uh, why does it have to be 30 feet high? Why couldn't it come out at a lower level? Well, that's, that's a pretty standard height for uh, backstops, the type of type baseball being played there, 30 feet. Yeah. 25 to 30 feet is pretty the standard. I'll just say <coughs> the age group that is right now planning to play there is uh, 13, 14-year-olds, exactly the same age group that is at Mariners. And the 30-foot backstop is, is a, exactly like Mariners, and that's what that's the safety of it. So if we stay with that age group, that's what would go there. And that right now, there's 17 teams playing in that age bracket, and so a field like that needs is in need somewhere. And um, that's what's there for now is that 30-foot bat. It's exactly what you saw March 1st out at Mariners, and. That age group is what baseball is looking for in terms of how to accommodate. I wanted to point out one last thing. There will be no ball field lights or athletic lights at this facility. Maybe some bollard lights along the walkway and a security light in the parking lot, but other than that, no lights. And we would lock it up, the parking lot at dusk and things like that, and schedule it accordingly to be sensitive to our use's impacts on the neighborhood. That's down the road right now. It's just a rough concept. So if there's any questions of Rick, 
Uh, no, we'll turn yeah. it back to you. I think uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dago has one. Uh, so uh, there wouldn't be fencing because you're obviously using these multi-use fields. Well, the, the fence, yeah, the fence, no, just the backstop really is all you can Right, but here. in terms of the, the outfield here? Yeah, we probably would put a small, about four foot high fence along the edge here, and we did in the Indian Sports Park. We put a fence on it, kind of contain the balls, keep them going off down the okay. Yeah, it's kind of a safety thing. And how far is home plate to Superior or PCH? Oh, boy, that's, a lot. that's probably, what, 500 feet? Okay, so nothing a 14 year old yeah. can oh, reach. No, no, okay. no, Thank no. you. Councilman Rosansky? I, I don't really have any questions. I just have a few comments. Uh, does anybody have questions of the consultant? No, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Um, as uh, Wes mentioned earlier, I've been involved with this project recently, as I've been involved with this project since I've got on to uh, City Council. This piece of property is, was owned by Caltrans, and through the work of a lot of people before me, um, namely Louise Greeley, who most of you know from Newport Crest, and others, um, I think Mike Johnson was involved, I don't know if he's here today or not, um, city staff, uh, through a lot of hard effort, there was some legislation that was passed years ago, and then ultimately Caltrans decided to sell this property to the city. Um, our general plan shows this piece of property, this park site, to be an active park, and I know that's created a problem with, for some of the folks in, who live in Newport Crest, but as far as, as long as I've been on city council in four and a half years, it's been an active park. We went back and did a little research, and my two predecessors talked about this property as being an active park. Jan DeBay, there's articles in the you know, Daily Pod and the Register, and even Gary Proctor talked about this being an active park. So it really shouldn't be any revelation to people that this is going to be an active park. Um, I think the city bought the property with the understanding that it was going to be an active park, and I think the legislation that was passed in Sacramento to allow this to happen was done with the understanding that there would be ball fields. We represented to the state at the time that we were acquiring this piece of property we wanted to in order to create an active park here. So that being said, it, this park is butts up right next to uh, Newport Crest condominiums. And so obviously the folks there and many of the people in the audience here t this afternoon live there are concerned about what goes on there. And we've kind of entered into this process and I want to thank you know our staff and, and the folks at EPT and certainly all the residents for participating in this process and the outreach meetings that we've had and the meeting at uh, PB&R um, to kind of look at this plan and kind of digest it and see where we can make changes. Now my feeling is, I know uh, Councilman Gardner asked a good question, why does it have to be 30 feet high? Because that is right in the view there. And the, the, for better or for worse, the scenic view easement that we negotiated as part of the deal, and that's why we got it for $5 million. Let's face it, 15, or what is it, 12, 15 acres of land for $5 million, ocean view land. I mean, if I could do one more deal like that for myself, I could retire for the rest of my life. So obviously it was a great deal. We had to accept that in order to keep the price down. And it creates issues um, uh, with regard to how we're going to lay out this piece of property. But, you know, the baseball diamond is really what's driving the design here to a large degree because of the backstops where they would need to be because of how you have to lay out the field. And, you know, my thinking on this has come around. I've been persuaded by some of the work and some of the designs presented by some of the residents there and going out and viewing the site. And I encourage my fellow council members, I know the residents of, I see the Lombardis out in the audience here, they've uh, graciously opened up their home as well as other homes to kind of really see how it looks from their point of view. But we really don't have to have a 30 foot high backstop with uh, uh, um, a baseball field in that exact position. Um, I've talked with uh, or met with some of the baseball folks. They've been out to see this. And, you know, if we decide to do away with the, that age group that Wes was just talking about, the 13 to 14 year olds, and kind of gear the field more to the little guys, more like the coach pitch and the, the tee ball, you don't need a 30 foot backstop because those kids, you know, they're lucky to hit it off the tee ball. Um, and they're certainly not hitting balls back and they're not hitting it 500 feet into Coast Highway. So if we do away with that, portion of it and kind of shift it into a, a lower gear here, it opens up a lot more possibilities is the way I see it. And we can reposition that field maybe into the other corner 
um, even maybe further out because you don't, might not even need permanent structures. And that's part of the problem that we have with Calstrans. We can't put any permanent structures within the scenic view area. But if you can have removable backstops or, you know, I don't know all the type of equipment that's available, certainly there's other options. You know, we can play with that a little bit more. If we remove the ball field from there, that then it frees up, I think, a lot of the rest of the design. I mean, we have the restrooms up there, and we have the tot lot, as Wes had mentioned, the tot lot's up near the residences because we want to keep it out of the, the stray balls. Well, if you move the baseball diamond further down to closer to Superior, and if you have you know much smaller kids playing there, it doesn't become that much of an issue. And the tot lot can be moved further closer to Coast Highway. The restrooms can be moved closer to Coast Highway, and it could be redesigned somewhat. So my thinking on it certainly has evolved. I mean, it's not even that we absolutely, you know, all the baseball people out in the audience should hold their ears. I mean, we don't even have to technically have a baseball diamond there. There's other opportunities that we might be able to enhance other fields for baseball within West Newport and maybe just leave this as a soccer only field. You know, I'll leave that up to maybe some discussion from the rest of the council if we would want to go down that road. But certainly the 13 to 14 year age group of baseball uh, field here is does not seem in my mind appropriate for the site in view of the fact that there are significant views over this property um, there's significant issues about uh, with regard to noise and how that's going to impact the neighbors there um, and so my recommendation or my thinking on it now is that we move towards a, a design that doesn't emphasize the baseball as much de-emphasize that with a smaller field and try and reposition some of the elements here to soften the impact a little bit. Uh, Wes? You, you intimated, at least uh, in your comments, that the demand was for the 13, 14-year-old type baseball. Is there the demand for the coach pitch and other areas? And if, if, if so, if there is a demand for the 13 and 14, is there another spot where we could accommodate them? The answer to all that is yes, <laughs> and we may be getting out a little ahead of, of what the group has to say. Lance Bell is here from Newport Harbor, and I think they're waiting to speak. Lance told me before the meeting, and Lance is right there, is Fred here, that they have 17 teams of the 13, 14 year age bracket, so I don't want to speak for them on what their priorities are. They have needs in all age groups, and baseball, I will say, all the way up till just all the way up till today has been very cooperative. Fred Cornwell, Lance, all of Newport Harbor baseball has been extremely cooperative with us in listening to everything and and being kind of beat up a little bit in the process at times. But they've been very cordial about it all, and they continue to be willing to work with us as is soccer and I think the neighbors in Newport Crest. So when we hear from everybody today, maybe some different kind of look beyond where we are right now is is a good thing to do but I don't want to speak definitively about which age group is the highest priority. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, is there any other staff presentation on this or is that it? That's it. That's it, okay. Uh, how many people are gonna to want to speak this afternoon? If you can raise your hands. Okay, um, with the council's concurrence, I'm gonna limit the comments to three minutes on this. Okay, so we'll set the timer for three minutes. There's a little blue box on the podium you have when the yellow light comes on you have one minute left and when the red light comes on your time's up so please come forward if you wish to speak and state your name for the record might as well throw the baseball guy up here as quick as we can <laughs> Lance Bell I'm a board member of Newport Harbor Baseball Association and uh, I have four children and I think this does matter because I have a 14 year old finishing baseball and I also have a seven-year-old that's just starting baseball. And I do know last year I was the president and I'm the vice president this year because I coach and it's a conflict, but I'm so involved in running it, raising the corporate sponsorship and all that. The support that Newport Harbor Baseball Association provides to this league and I mean this area and also Costa Mesa is not only did we get a phenomenal place at Mariners that I know Nancy was out there and everybody else was out there, but we put twelve to fifteen thousand dollars into those batting cages. Those are our machines. Those are our nets. And all we want to do is get great structure, and we'll add to it. We'll raise the money, and we'll do everything. The fences out there that beautify Mariners um, baseball, 
Those are our fences. At our expense, we put in all the top yellow and the uh, temporary fences. Um, at Bob Henry, we just put a $10,000 infield into a Newport Beach City project we did. We also put out the fences out there to beautify and to make it feel like a baseball complex. So we're just here to support. We're here to support soccer. We're here to support basketball. I raise money for the Boys and Girls Club. I just want to make this a good place for kids because I'm not only am I raising them, but I hope to have grandchildren someday. I hope to live that long. So I'm very supportive of soccer. I'm very supportive of lacrosse. Whatever we can do here, if it's an active park, one of the questions that came up to us, <clears throat> excuse me, was we have an active park coming in. And um, what are your needs? Wants are lights, but we don't go there, right, Mr. Webb? We want needs, and our needs are the 14-year-old division. What we have built over the last couple years um, is the largest 14 and 13-year-old baseball division as far that I know. Losal has 15 teams. Right now we're in the process. We do all the scheduling for 17 teams, and that also involves Costa Mesa Pony. We took over the charter, Newport Harbor Association, for CDM Pony. So now we are kind of the 14-year-old baseball world. So one of the things that we do is we we use um, East Bluff, and that's on the other side of the bay, but that is an NHBA permit and under our charter, and we keep that division as CDM. Um, so we use that, and then we use Ensign School. And Ensign School is, you know, to be fair, is a mockery of a baseball structure. We just put in a brand new infield, $12,500. We scraped it, did it, did the whole thing, built new mounds. But we don't have a proper structure, and we're still playing there, and we enjoy it, and please don't take it back from us. Uh, Costa Mesa, because of the baseball structure that we've provided for the 14- and 13-year-olds, allows us to use T-Winkle with lights. And that is a pet peeve, but I went in front of them and explained to them exactly what our intent is, is to make a great division for kids of all Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. That yes, is can our you, intention. Uh, can you wrap it up? I'm sorry. But anyways, so our process here is to get more provide. They also allowed us Davis and Lions Park. We put up new safety nets, new huge poles, and we spent money for that structure. So what we're looking for is a in an active park. Our biggest needs are for the 14 and 13 year olds. And I would be love to add an idea for the other divisions, but that's how we got to this point. I'm sorry. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I just quickly because you're talking about Ensign, like you don't. Have the structure there that right. you need. Are you talking about the actual physical structure of, yes, of, sir. or the size of the field? Or? The, both, the physical structure and the size. And we want to work, we have to stay within the school, uh, what the school wants, but the backstop is very inadequate. Mm -hmm. The outfield is very awkward, but it works, and we use it. Like I said, we spent money there, so we're very supportive of it. But it's someday that should be a practice field, and these boys should have an appropriate field from the city of Newport Beach besides East Block. What, what, about, well, oh, I'm sorry, what about Bob Henry Park? You didn't mention that. Does, both of those are for the 10-year-olds, and it's in, I, in I would, we don't have enough room for the big body. I know, but if we boys. move, the, let's say you move the 10-year-olds off of Bob Henry and. Not enough room. Uh, that I'm was, sorry. That, that sound, we don't have enough room, I don't believe. That, that was a, my question. Are there other fields where we could make adjustments in the schedules so that we would get the necessary fields for the 13 to 14 year olds by moving. And I don't know if Coach Pitch pays, plays at um, Bonita Canyon. Uh, actually, the machine pitch kids play at uh, Woodland. Or no, the Heights, at the Heights. And that's just a, a big grass school field that has no baseball real structure. We just use it for the little boys. So and that's what I would present is if we're going to lose this case, go, I'll go down to 25 feet. I'll go down to 20 feet. But again, I, I'm respectful to the people that live there. And I also understand when I look out my front door, I used to see a bluff. Now I see the castaways. And the castaways now look at ba baseball parks with children playing in them. And so I have been out there, and I think it's a beautiful place to live. And it's not for me to vote upon. It's for you fine people to do that. But there is growth, and there is a need for active parks. And we do need a 14-year-old field. And I would be more than happy to create another uh, machine pitch, two little diamonds, as long as us, and it's an active park, and we do need fields as much as anybody else. So, well, 
Councilman Hen. Are, are you suggesting that for 14 year old, you don't need a 30 foot backstop? A 20 foot I, backstop would be adequate? I think we could. I don't, as long as you allow me to give my ideas on how to, because I looked at T Winkle and they blew that one. I think I know how to do it. I think you can drop the 25, and I think as long as you run your, your nets appropriately across home plate, you give up the foul ball, but you take what you can get. And that's, I don't, think that would be a problem with 25 foot. I, do, I just don't. Okay. Any other questions? Thank I you. I mean, anything to save to make everybody's life a little bit easier. So. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, please. Sure, and keep an eye on that little box there. Absolutely. I will be short. My name is Tom Greeley, and uh, my mother, would Louise Greeley, would be very, very uh, excited to see the uh, uh, progress of this piece of property. Um, I think the things that she would be looking for is the uh, uh, the, uh, the ability to get in and out of the park safely uh, from Pacific Coast Highway. There seems to be uh, some issues with the proximity to the corner of Superior and uh, Pacific Coast Highway. That is a, uh, uh, I just, I guess the point I'm making is to ensure that the city uh, makes that as safe a uh, uh, crossing as physically possible with however you choose to uh, set up ingress and egress into the park. And uh, I think the, uh, the use of the park uh, for the most part, especially uh, thinking about uh, uh, the total community using this facility, uh, is is a marvelous uh, uh, activity for this city. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jay Westfall. I'm a uh, homeowner of uh, Nine Swift Court, which is right at the junction of C and D there uh, in the presentation. I'm very impressed with uh, the council and the uh, community's efforts to work together when there are different needs and, and wants. Um, the first question that I have to the council is, uh, with the addition of multiple trees in there, um, is there a plan to maintain the height of those trees so that the look 10 years from now is similar to the look now? The uh, second thing that I wanted to point out are, as an individual homeowner, my um, thoughts on needs are safety and privacy. And I'm talking about safety of the homeowners and privacy. Uh, as the uh, property exists now, it's somewhat of a um, pedestrian traffic way where especially in the holidays, people park up in the Newport Crest and hike down to the beach areas. So with more um, amount of pedestrian traffic for the park, I have a concern about that as well. Lastly, I'd like to say that the design that's been presented today has a very strong appeal to me. I like the flow where the heavier traffic areas are down lower, uh, and then it becomes uh, a nice transition to more of a passive area on the upper end. So I applaud the uh, design of that. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Jenny Lombardi, and I live at Seven Landfall Court, and in the proposed design, I live on the third baseline. So to give you an orientation, um, I want to extend an invitation to all of the council members to visit our home um, and other homes in the Crest, and we are available, since my husband and I are both retired, we're available um, most days and weekends. So if you want to come one at a time or in a group, please contact us. We'd love to have you come in and visit. Um, in Newport Crest, there's 460 homes, 43 of them um, border the perimeter of the park, and I've lived in Landfall Court for, we have lived in Landfall Court for 24 years. Um, the issue I'm gonna address mainly is the noise issue and what I call the stadium effect that uh, this current design would have on the homeowners and the residents. Um, the term not in my backyard basically really does apply because this is our backyard. We, our deck goes right up to the, the perimeter of the park. 
Uh, there's no buffer zone. There's nothing in between us and the park. Um, there's no berm, no trees, no sound wall, no distance, no road, anything that could help buffer the sound coming from uh, the park. Uh, my husband and I visited some other parks and we noticed that there are some of those components built into or naturally occurring at some of the other parks in Newport uh, Beach. Uh, the crest homes on the perimeter rise 30 to 40 feet above Sunset Ridge and it's basically a solid wall and it's a solid wall of our living rooms and our bedrooms. Um, already noise in the park and people do use it, um, echoes from the buildings and the perimeter homes would basically be the sound wall for the rest of Newport Crest. And the stadium effect could not be fixed. As I mentioned, there's, there, it can't be diverted, it can't be deflected. Uh, a sound wall is not feasible in this location. Um, we kind of said we'd be living in Sunset Stadium. Um, the general plan states that Sunset Ridge has been designated as an active park. And since the general plan can be amended, and I understand it's a very difficult process, but it can be amended as evidenced by Hogue's recent application to amend it, um, I think in the future what the city might be facing is that there may be other situations in which the general plan does not apply. Uh, it may be inappropriate to implement uh, as in this situation. My impression is we were invited into the outreach process after it had started, after the athletic groups had their input where and when the decisions were made to have two soccer fields and a baseball field, and who made the decisions. Um, it seems that outreach could have been done and maybe should have been done prior to those decisions. We feel that it needs to be a park. Sunset Ridge is beautiful land. It is the perfect location. It needs to be used by people who will appreciate it and all groups of people, more groups than just athletes. Um, having the fields the way they are would take acres of land away as parkland that could be used by other groups in the area. Um, families, residential, um, the retirement homes, convalescent homes and, and such. And I think the city is sensitive to the needs of all the residents and Sunset Ridge needs to be a park. Uh, it's not the right location for this active of a sports park. Um, so I appreciate also the, I see the red light flashing, I'm sorry. Um, but I do appreciate the outreach process and what the city has done and the people that we've worked with. Uh, I think they've been listening and uh, Mr. Rosansky, it seems as if you've been listening also, which I appreciate. Uh, and in closing, I do want to reiterate our invitation to you to visit our home, um, to see it from the other side. Going in between the buildings doesn't give you the same effect as actually being in a home, in a living room or on a deck. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi there, my name is Christy Flesvig and I'm a home, homeowner at Nine Landfall Court, which is right in the center by the, where the baseball diamond would be. Um, just to give you a little background on myself, I have a CPA, a master's in athletics, and also an ocean view, so I think I come from a pretty good perspective on where I'm coming from in this. But um, obviously um, I'm concerned about you know, any violation of the, of the ocean view that I'm gonna see. I'm also a single person that has chosen at this point not to have children. And so for me, the tot lot being right out there is a huge issue right off my deck. And obviously we've heard a lot about the view, but the noise level has not been addressed, I don't think in a way that you know is gonna make me feel comfortable to know when is that noise gonna start and end and what's reasonable for a weekend or at the end of the day. Um, the other issue is I run up and down Superior pretty much every day with my dog. And on two separate occasions, I have had cars hit the curb behind me, get flat tires, um, multiple accidents have occurred. There's been um, deaths that I've seen a body line on the street on Ticonderoga and Superior. And so I don't know if we've looked at, done an accident analysis on Superior and PCH, but I'm very familiar with the way the lights work there. And even I often get caught not quite getting across the street. It's an extremely, extremely dangerous um, intersection. And I don't know what the comparison of accidents are there as compared to MacArthur and PCH or Jamboree and PCH, but it's, to me, got to be a huge issue. I received this in the mail today from the Orange County Transportation Authority. Um, they're doing an assessment of the buildup of traffic on um, Newport Boulevard and how it's so congested through there. So I'm not sure how that you know is going to play into the analysis of how people are going to get in and out. And then finally, um, as far as I was a little concerned when they came up with the parking lot and 
you know, how do we know that the parking is going to fit the demands of what this park needs? You know, have we done a good analysis? Is this is the number of people that come. This is what's going to work. And how are we going to monitor that and that, know that beach people aren't going to be going there and then therefore the park people are going to have to go to the, where the beach parking is or into us? And how are we going to make sure people are leaving? And I mean, that whole thing, I know, I'm sure you're looking at that. And I just heard, you know, Obviously, you gave a great <laughs> talk, but you know there seems to be a lot of thinking, and it's awkward, and it works. And but how are we measuring demand? I've gone jogging all over this town, and I see a lot of empty fields a lot of times. And you know, have we really done the proper analysis of these other baseball parks? So, um, I guess that's pretty much covers. And the tot lot, I, I've said this a couple times publicly, but I mean, we're doing this plus we're a babysitting service for other families. You know, it's just kind of like how much. How far do we need to go? On top of it, I've got restrooms and parking and slamming doors, all right in an isolated area. So anyway, that's my feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Braun. I'm the Regional Commissioner of AYSO Region 97. Hope you're enjoying that Mayor's Cup we delivered about a month ago. I hear it's not sitting in Sean's office. That's a positive. Um, with respect to Sunset Ridge, uh, we've been participating in the community outreach, and we, we will continue to, uh, to work with the residents to make sure that the nuisance that they perceive is as little as possible. We've always tried to do that in situations where we've been faced with residential um, communities nearby fields such as Bob Henry or Mariners. Anytime issues have been raised to us, at either of those locations, we've tried to work with the community, and we intend to do so um, even at this location as well. Uh, I want to speak briefly about the needs of our region. Uh, we have 1,000 Newport Beach children that participate in our region. We have two soccer fields in Westside Newport Beach for those 1,000 children. We have one field at Mariners, and we have one field at Bob Henry. During the spring, we have no soccer fields on the west side of Newport Beach because Mariners and Bob Henry are dedicated to baseball during their primary season. So the need is great. That doesn't mean that if we develop soccer fields here at Sunset Ridge, we're now going to have a 1,000 kids showing up on a Saturday at Sunset Ridge. The fact of the matter is that we have the opportunity to have fields on the east side of Newport Beach that we share with Region 57. And there, are, there is a school site at Ensign. There's a small track field where we have our eight-year-olds play. Additionally, in addition to the 1,000 Newport Beach residents we have participating in our region, we also have 800 Costa Mesa children. So we go to the city of Costa Mesa to receive fields, and we get fields like Kaiser, Harper, Back Bay, and we receive all those fields primarily from the city of Costa Mesa. And as you recognize, those are all school district fields. There are no park fields that we use in Costa Mesa. So... Um, our, our, our need is great. It is especially great in the spring when we have approximately five to 600 Newport Beach children playing. Because of those five to 600 children, 75% of them are, are women, girls, because girls don't play a lot of other sports during the course of the year besides soccer, perhaps volleyball, perhaps softball, but soccer is their primary year-round sport. So a facility like this for us to be able to use it year-round would greatly benefit the, the female youth. Um, in terms of how many people would be there on a given Saturday, I would estimate in a given hour you're probably looking about 80 to 100 people because if you have two soccer fields, you're probably looking at about 40 to 50 between the players and the families there at the same time. So, again, it's not where 1,000 people are convening on the park at a given time. You probably have about 80 to 100 per hour. The use would be from 4 p.m. until dusk weekdays, and on weekends, Saturday it would be from about 9 a.m. until about 4 p.m. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Perfect timing. Hello, my name is uh, Fareed Ghanem, and I live in Serena Court. And basically, I have a couple of points to make real fast, and then I have a couple questions. Um, the points are basically going to address the parking, the park access, and hours of sporting activity, et cetera. Basically, what this gentleman just said, first of all, I love the park. I love the idea. But there obviously are some concerns here. Um, it's currently slotted for 75 parking spots. And as this gentleman just stated, there could be 80 to 100 people at one time within an hour, not alone transitional periods from when one game starts to the other. 
all the other people that are going to be parking in that lot, where is everybody else going to park? Last time we were here, a gentleman uh, came up talking about a pedestrian entrance at the corner, and one of the council members said it wouldn't be a good idea because of traffic. Uh, the gentleman who helping design the park, I forget his name, but he said if you don't find a way, if you don't build the people a way in, they're going to dig a hole. Common sense says they're going to find the least possible path to park since there's not enough parking. Where is that going to be? Newport Crest. Your access to and from the park, you've got to ride in, ride out. Everybody's going to come up superior and they're going to look for the shortcut into the park. They're going to hop right in. There's no barriers. Another gentleman mentioned the safety. That's another one of my concerns. The general public is going to say that parking lot is full. It's never available. So what are they going to do? They're going to walk into Newport Crest and they're going to, there's no barriers. They're going to hop right over from the wall and just go back and forth and use our neighborhoods as, you know, as their entrance and, enter, as entrance and exit. Um, I mean, what are you guys, is there any planning done on different access? Are there barriers separating our homes from, so people can't just hop back and forth? Has anybody discussed that? Um, the, the sporting fields, I personally feel that baseball would be better for the people that have those front units than soccer, simply because baseball is not a year-round sport. So it takes a little less burden from them, but again, uh, my biggest, my other thing is the sports activity, the hours. I know they're slotted for certain hours. Are there going to be any restrictions in place for all the people that decide to come in? Say the part, say the soccer field doesn't start until 8 o'clock. What about all the people who go like to practice, say, all right, everybody be here at 6. What about the general public who are going to practice until the end of, you know, until it gets too dark out to see anymore? Are there going to be any restrictions on that? Those are my questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Robert Orby. I'm a resident of Newport Crest. And um, I just have a couple comments. First is, I mean, I think you did a great job with the design. I mean, it's really going to be a, a wonderful enhancement to the community. Um, I've recently walked the property in regards to your question about how far home plate is. <clears throat> I One of the designs says 285 feet. I paced off home plate to that ridge there on Superior, that closest point in center field. I got 350. And it's all downhill. You get a Santa Ana. I mean, the kid they had here last week, I mean, he said he was only 15. I mean, the guy was a monster. And I was thinking, we need a bigger bigger ballpark. Um, and then what happens if it's just for those age groups? I mean, when someone's not playing baseball, some 18-year-olds come to play, you know, to play around, and, you know, one of those guys shags the ball into Superior. We've got some serious problems with that. Uh, my other comment is in the... Um, he calls it a slope. I mean, it's almost a mountain that has to be graded to make the road to put the parking lot in. There's actually a parking lot, a gravel one, but already in existence right there at the entrance. And I was curious why that was not considered to be in used. And there's already a pedestrian trail that, I mean, it's very close. I mean, it's no further. And then that would free up a lot of space to, as you were suggesting, move stuff down closer to PCH. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Porter. My wife and I, Linda, live at 18 Encore Court. We do back up to the park. Uh, I'd like to commend everybody involved because it's been a great process the whole way. But we have a couple of concerns, uh, and I can second what the gentleman just said. I've been involved in youth sports for over 30 years. 75 parking places is not enough for this type of facility. People are going to be crossing the Coast Highway, and my big concern is the safety for how they're going to get to the park. They're not going to be able to park in the parking lot where the little shopping center is now because they'll get kicked out. They'll park in the other part of the city parking, which is now beach parking, which requires them to walk all the way down to the Coast Highway, cross Superior, and then come up to the park. They're kids are not going to do that. They're going to cross Superior, which is a high traffic area. The entrance and egress is only going to be for northbound Pacific Coast Highway. People are going to try to make left turns or U-turns. When you go out of the park, you're going to have to go north on Coast Highway. That's going to create an cr incredible traffic mess at 62nd and at Prospect and at Orange because those people need to turn around and go back home. My last concern is taking the existing sound wall out of the west side of the park. It was put there for a reason to block the traffic noise from Superior. And if we lower that whole slope and take that sound wall off, that really does, it, rather than enhance the view, it really destroys 
part of the purpose of living in Newport Crest. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. Are we planning to fully signalize that intersection where the road comes into Coast Highway, or is that right in, right out? We would like to signalize it. The problem is going to be in dealing with Caltrans. They have specific requirements uh, in order to be able to place that signal. And we'll certainly try to do our best to convince them that a signal would work, um, but it may come down to their final decision. If we ever accept the highway, then obviously we'll have control of that. Councilman Webb? Wouldn't uh, the location be the same location as the Banning Ranch is assuming would be the intersection of Bluff Road? Yes, it would be that exact location if there was to be a roadway there. Assuming that there is a development and there is a roadway, then it would probably qualify for a signal ultimately. But I think at this point, our park is going to be going in well before the decision uh, whether or not there's going to be a development there or even a roadway will, will come sometime in the future. Okay. Councilman Rosansky? Yeah, I was going to hold my comments till the end, but since we are discussing the access in and out, it is an issue. Certainly, uh, light is the, the ultimate solution there because that would allow the, the best flow of traffic both e it's actually not north it's west coast highway and east coast highway but uh, and that's you know if you were tuned into our council meeting I think it was last meeting we discussed uh, moving forward with an initiative with uh, Caltrans to take over the highway and this is exactly one of the reasons why we need to do that aside from other considerations of traffic signalization in at Superior and Coast Highway at uh, uh, Dover and Coast Highway at um, Tustin and Riverside and Coast Highway uh, landscaping issues on Coast Highway. So, you know, my hope is that about the time that this project is ready to come online, hopefully that highway will be part of Newport Beach and we will be able to put the intersection in as it should be. Okay, thank you. Okay, next speaker. Hi, my name is Fred Cornwell. I'm president of uh, Newport Harbor Baseball Association. Uh, I think if you uh, were discussing fields and field usage, if you check uh, your parks commissioner logs of uh, how much we're on our fields. We are always on our fields. We have coaches begging for more time. So active baseball diamonds are a big a big need for us. Um, I, I heard part of Lance's uh, explanation on how we could reduce the height of the backstop. A good case study would be uh, Lyons Davis Field. That, that backstop is 25 feet. We're intimately familiar with it because we had to build uh, nets along the side and actually I had to design it and it's at 25 feet. What we did there, we put a net over the backstop, we moved the home plate underneath the net so the foul balls would go up into the net. So it's, everything's encapsulated there. Um, also I heard uh, about the 350 feet. We do not have kids hitting the ball 350 feet. Just point blank. We don't. I wish we did and with these new bats they, they may in the future. But, uh, you know, we've, uh, Lions Park is a great case study for that. 287 down the line, no one's hit the fence yet. We do have kids probably hitting at 300, 310 maybe. But uh, if, if the fence is set 350, there's, you know, that's, that's Dodger Stadium time and Angel Stadium. So that, that's a long hook. And really, this dimension of, of this park fits um, a pony field this perfect. Uh, with respect to parking, we have uh, 12 kids on each team, typically. So that's 24 kids on, on the field at any one time. So uh, we're talking about 24, you know, maybe 30 cars max. You know, half the parents drop off for, for a baseball game. That's, that's what it is. They park at Ensign on the field and, you know, half the parents drop them off and don't, uh, don't even attend the games a lot of the times. So, uh, you know, as far as parking goes, baseball would reduce uh, that quite a bit. Thank you. Um, I just have one question. Do they have um, backstops that have like a, uh, a netting that can be dropped down to a certain height or something so that you only pull it up to its full height when you're actually playing the game? Well, you could put it on a pulley system. That's what we had to do over in uh, uh, Lions Park. There's actually pulleys on the top because we couldn't justify the wind loads on the existing backstop. So, so it's so permanent up to a certain height and above that it can be dropped down? Well, it's right now it's up up all the way and then when we get that you know 60 mile an hour wind that always hits Costa Mesa um, we would lower at that point but that will never happen so yes there are pulley systems that you could you could put on it 
raise the nets when you're playing the games and then lower it once you're done with it. Okay, thank you. But the, the actual poles are not adjustable, just the nets go up and down? Uh, well, I'm not an expert at that. No, I'm, I'm um, saying what you have. What, 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 what we have there are permanent poles. Permanent poles. Right. I, I don't know about hitting 350 feet, but I know when I um, threw out the first pitch at Little League last year for the championship game, there was a kid apparently could throw a fastball 80 miles an hour. So I know there's some pretty pretty talented kids. My question is with the fastball, um, I mean with the backstop, it would seem though that by reducing the angle or increasing the angle that you can shorten the height of the backstop. And what it does is it would cut off the, foul, the opportunity to hit foul balls. So you could continue to, I mean, realistically, how far could you bring that backstop down? Well, what we have at Lions Park, we have, it's 25 foot, and then it's flat across the top. So, I mean, foul ball goes, so it's 25 foot maximum at the at that backstop level. So it's that's as flat as you're going to get. The pitchers don't like it because the catcher can't catch the foul balls, but, you know, so, you know, who really cares about that? <laughs> also, about the 80 miles an hour, the there's pitcher no little league <laughs> pit pitchers pitching 80 miles an hour. There's no little league guys pitching 80 miles an hour. But uh. okay, thank you. Anything else? Great. Next speaker, please. <laughs> Not this group. Hello. My name is Jane Drew. I live at Six Whip Court. <clears throat> I'm a little nervous. Noise, noise, noise. I bought into the Crest 11 years ago because it was quiet. I'm a writer. And what I've been hearing is that this park is going to be used from dawn to sunset. Maybe not by the teams, but people practicing and other kids and older people coming. It's going to be noisy seven days a week from sun up to sundown. And um, as uh, Ginny Lombardi said, the people right there, I'm three in, but hey, I'm going to hear it all the time too. Um, it, it, it's like living in a stadium. Um, I'm worried about safety. I, I have said this before, but my roommate, and I think the city had to pay for this, was the person who was hit on Superior uh, Avenue, and um, he's a quadriplegic now. I believe the city had to come up with some money for that. Uh, but personally, it's the noise, and I, and they're just, I think they were said there were 42 homes along there, but if you go in, you know, to the, the whole courtyard, it, it's at least a quarter of the people who are going to be directly impacted all the time by this constant noise. And, and I, I, you know, the last time I was up here, and I don't know if this is rude or not, but I said, if, because we do need this, I, I get that, I hear everybody, but if this were right outside your front window, would you be voting for it? I mean, yes, we need it, but right outside your front window, they were going to put in this park that was going to be busy from sun up to sundown. Would any any of you go for it? So I know there are needs, but um, I think this could be a passive park with a lot less noise and a lot happier people. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gloria Quirk. I'm a Villa Balboa resident as well as a board member. I'm also the grandmother of five, uh, actively involved in youth sports. And um, I, kn I know that there are great ne needs for fields, but I have grave concerns about the proximity of the park to Coast Highway and Superior. It's an extremely dangerous intersection, and I just think that we need to really, really take that into consideration. Also with youth sports comes the need for food, um, they're going to be trying to cross to go to Jack in the Box and over to the market there. Some of the children may be unattended. Um, I just think that it's something that you need to take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Selich, Mayor Pro Tem Daigle, members of council. My name is Byron DeArticle. 
I have a business at 180 Newport Center Drive, and I represent uh, soccer families for Newport Fields. We are a coalition of families that represent about 4,000 kids who play soccer in AYSO regions 97, 57, and the club uh, teams in town. We're on the record in many of the public access meetings with respect to our position on the concept plan, so I won't bore you with those facts. You can review the record. Suffice it to say we're very happy with the concept plan as it's uh, in its current iteration and as it evolves for the fact that there are soccer field overlays on it. A couple of things I would, I would have you think about is that I think it's important for the council to respect the process and the citizenry who put together the general plan and voted for it and in that this park is designated as an active park. I think that's important to keep in mind. I think the second thing also is you could take this conversation about building a park to any neighborhood in Newport Beach, Newport Coast, East Bluff, Mariners, neighborhoods, wherever, and you will have 80 of those people showing up saying no, noise, noise, noise. The problem is, is that the demand for youth soccer is growing in this town, and it probably will keep growing, and the demographic ultimately in all cities shifts and gets younger and more families move in. The question is, if not here, where? You've invested $15 million in a piece of property. There's a huge need for active recreational facilities in the town. I would suggest that that $15 million investment would best be leveraged by providing a park that serves the greatest need, the greatest good. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Mayor Selich, uh, members of the council, my name is Tom Anderson. I am the field coordinator for the Newport Mesa Soccer Club. And I would just like to buttress uh, Byron's points for the needs for fields and sort of make an appeal as a father of two daughters. Um, I have the latest CIF survey of participants uh, in California in sports, and by far away, soccer is the number one sports for females. Uh, it has grown by almost 10% just since the year 2000, and the survey's only just finished in 2007. It's also moved up to the number three boys sport, growing by almost 14% only behind football and track and field. Um, I'm a very big advocate of active use parks. I think that passive parks are a waste of space, frankly. Um, we absolutely need fields, especially for, if you look at CIF statistics, we're looking at adolescents here. Adolescent folks need bigger places to play. Unfortunately, my wife being a school teacher in the Newport Mesa School District, I can tell you a lot of the fields at schools are no longer available. They have plunked down hundreds of portable units for adult education. This means that the field space that even at Ensign, I don't know that if the council is aware, they cannot have a home game on their own field because it's too small. So there are growing problems because the fields are shrinking and the kids get bigger. Now I don't want to go into what happens to an adolescent youth that doesn't have a sport to play, where do they turn? I think everybody knows where that goes. I, I can't stress enough to keep this as an active park. I myself was on the general plan update committee. This land was looked at as an active park. I expect it to be an active park. It was passed as an active park. Um, as far as parking concerns, I, I, I understand the concerns of the neighbors. I live near Mariners Park. I know Mr. Webb near, lives near Mariners Park. I can tell you that most people do not come in droves of 100 for soccer games. Uh, there's only 24 players on a team. Most of the time it's a carpool. The biggest change you see in cars is at practices where one team is coming off and another team is dropping off. But I can assure you parents don't stick around for a two-hour practice. So with that in mind, I would like to just appeal to the council to really consider keeping this as an active park and keeping it as large as possible so that we can have fields for the adolescents. We have plenty of tot parks and little tiny parks for the little kids to play but what we need is a place for the bigger kids to play. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Holliby. I live on uh, Columbia. Um, my main concern, uh, well, the noise for one, we got that Banning Ranch area that's completely open. And I don't know if the city's looked into maybe purchasing a couple hundred more yards on the left-hand side of the driveway that would be going into this park. Maybe you can put some fields down there. 
Um, another question I have is, um, I'm not, I don't own a front yard or a backyard, but how uh, how many soccer games can a uh, can a grass field um, handle like a week or a month before it just becomes a big dusty field? Um, the wind blows from the ocean. Sorry, I'm nervous. The wind blows from the ocean right into our condos. Nobody in Newport Crest has air conditioning. So seven, eight months a year, our windows have to stay open all day long, all night long. It gets very, very hot. We need that ocean breeze to keep our condos cool. And if that's going to have soccer games seven days a week, and on the weekends like 10 hours, I think we're going to have a big dusty field there, and all the dust and all the grass and everything's going to be blown right into our condos. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, but anyway, the Banning Ranch, there's so much space over there. You could temporarily maybe do this, but then later on, if you guys can purchase some land in the Banning Ranch area and put the fields there and then make this more of a, I don't know, does active have to be soccer? Does active have to be baseball? There's probably some other activities that we could put there other than baseball and, and soccer to make it truly active. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Beresford, and members of the council. As a resident of Newport Crest for 25 plus years, I'd like to publicly thank the City Council, the Parks and Recreation Commission for their diligence and fortitude in acquiring and developing these 15 acres we're calling Sunset Ridge Park. For over 20 years, um, our Newport Crest community activist, her son is here, uh, Louise Greeley, God rest her soul, um, tried to get the bluff top property near her home on Swift Court, which is then owned by Caltrans, to be purchased and transformed into a city park. That was her dream. The good news is that Louise fought that fight and lived to see the city by the parcel. Unfortunately, Louise died last year, and we who knew her miss her gentle yet firm guiding voice to help design a democratic active park which would benefit as many residents of the city of Newport Beach as possible. I trust and encourage the city council to honor her memory by including in your design a memorial to the woman who never gave up her dream. Thanks for that, Ms. Chair. Thank you. Any other speakers? Uh, Jim Karras, 12 Landfall Court, also been a resident of West Newport for close to 20 years um, down on Oceanfront. Uh, first, being a resident of Landfall, I'll just tell you, I don't really want to look through a, uh, a netting. I don't want to see posts or anything of, of that nature. <laughs> I think a more scaled down version if we're having a park there makes makes more sense. Um, I think there's a, a bit of a dilemma of a community that needs the space and we have a issue with a place that's not the ideal space. It's a pretty view space, but it's a, it's, it's a liability hazard there. Um, let me share a story, quick one. Grew up in Redondo Beach when I was about eight years old. I lived across from a park like that in a residential neighborhood right down like this area that you see there, which I guess is the... Uh, right off of uh, PCH. Uh, the street wasn't PCH that we would cross to get to the park. Uh, it was a much very passive street. It wasn't even like that at all. Uh, my, my, my friend Tom and I rushed over to the park one day, young boys. Uh, Tom didn't quite stop to, to look. Bolt wanted to get to the park right away. Right in front of me, got hit by a car, up 30 feet, landed on his head. Fortunately, he recovered. It was okay. It wasn't pretty, okay? That's the issue that I see with this, just growing up with something like that. We are knowingly putting a park, and I know we have the need for it, but we are knowingly putting a park into a very dangerous corner. And we know how kids are. They're going to rush there. They're going to rush for food. They're going to rush back and forth. I just say whatever you do there, just please take that in consideration. I think it's, we owe it to the kids, and we owe it as a legal liability to the city to really consider the best way to do that. Um, what I'm seeing is two... Uh, too much of a need and too small of a space. Um, maybe it makes sense. We've heard of traffic, noise, uh, safety concerns. Maybe it makes sense to scale it down a bit, have a little less there than trying to cram everything in there. 
and that would help control the, the noise. It would help control the traffic in and out of the park. It would help to control the safety of how many kids are rushing back and forth or if there's even a need for them to do that because there is ample parking. So maybe we don't need all that there, maybe a lot less. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine Adams. I own one Swift Court. I don't have a view right outside of my bedroom window, but I do have a view from my front um, deck. Um, I am, so many of the concerns that have been raised here today are mine. I, I won't get into detail about all of them, but I have to say more than anything, it's the noise. I think when we limit it to the issue of view, it sounds almost elitist. And I think when pitted against all of these, um, these concerns, these kind of egalitarian and, and democratic concerns about children and their interests in playing and, and using the space. I don't want to pit a lovely view against that. What I pit against it is that this is, some of the people who have been up here and who have spoken have talked about it being a stadium-like quality, and that is exactly how the whole area is built. We're built in circles. I can hear what people are doing across from my way, and we're, we're spread out quite a bit. There's quite a bit of distance between my condominium and a condominium directly across from here, and yet I, from my place, I can hear what they're doing across the way. It has an echo quality. I'm not on the front lines for the view. I'm right behind the front lines. I will hear everything just as well as all of the front line um, units. My, I was here uh, a week or so ago at um, some presentation before, I saw the same presentation before the planning, I think it was a subcommittee, and I raised the same point, which is that, and it's very similar to what the gentleman before me said, I, I, I am not, I have a 15 year old niece who has been involved in soccer, in softball, in basketball, and I love what it does for her self esteem and her life, and I think it's great for all students of all ages, all children. I'm not opposed to that. But what I am opposed to is trying to fit all of these things into a piece of land that is clearly not the right design for all of the lofty ideas. I, I think that the way that this council the city of Newport Beach could accommodate all of the interests is to scale it back down and to scale it considerably. We could address, as the gentleman before me said, we'd be addressing parking issues. The noise wouldn't be so much. And, and, and scaling back, by the way, meaning also not having both of those fields as close as they can possibly be to these units. Now it's been admitted it's because of the limited space that they're, that they're brought right up to within those few feet of the existing residences. Um, and one more thing, I said that in case that this is a foregone conclusion that there's no way we're gonna get this to be a passive park. But I wanna make two points about the history. Um, one of them is I, I got the copies of the three mentions in the general plan update about Sunset Ranch. Yeah, um, and it's all, all it did was mention that it was designated as an active park. What I would argue is that we really didn't have any sort of due process in discussing what an active park would be as voters, as residents, because one of the arguments can, can be made that when you're talking about after, active park, doesn't mean all of us understood active park to mean the, what other people are using that term. And that's it, and thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Sellett, City Council members. My name is Jan Bannerstood. I live in Newport Heights, and I'm a member of the Banning Ranch Task Force. Um, I'd like to make a comment about the landscaping of the park. Uh, whether you keep it active park or passive park, I would request that you uh, consider native landscaping, uh, especially on the bluffs, on the slopes, uh, in keeping with the environmental sensitivity of the Banning Ranch, which is uh, directly contiguous with this park. Uh, there already is a lot of uh, coastal sage type vegetation along the bluff sides right now. If you drive there, you will see the yellow flowers on the uh, hillside, which are the uh, coast sunflower in Celia, California. And that same kind of habitat can be placed along uh, the sides. You see the slopes up there with, a, with the little bushes. I request that that be uh, consistent with coastal bluff vegetation 
and I think that that will um, get it better uh, accepted by the Coastal Commission when you bring it to them too. You also might consider that the Banning Ranch plan itself, um, if we we're able to acquire it, that would include a 30-acre sports park. Uh, and if we had a 30-acre sports park there, do we need to have this park that would uh, impact the neighboring residences? So it might be uh, more of a reason to acquire the whole Banning Ranch so that perhaps this could be a, a passive park rather than an active park. But in any case, I would recommend that uh, you keep the uh, Coastal Bluff environmentally sensitive uh, habitat there. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Jan. Good afternoon. My name is Waldemar Moosman. I have lived, uh, my wife and I, we live on 20 Imaloa Court for the last 11 years in Newport Crest. And we lived the last, the Imaloa is actually the last building that you see there on the map. And we lived the, the third unit in from the right, which is 20 Imaloa. In other words, we are directly above the parking lot here and the toilet. And you may have this picture because that's what I just hear from this man, that there's a, a flowers. There are flowers growing, it is beautiful, and you want to make this into a parking lot. Nine years ago, I got involved through Louise Greeley, and the Orange County Harbors, Beaches, and Parks initiated the idea of a great Orange County River Park, open space. Sunset Ridge was planned to be a passive park, meaning a neighborhood city park to preserve the wildlife and its, its habitat. We had a couple of changes in city council since then. And District 2, where the property is located, has replaced two council members. There has been no communication between the council member and his constituents recently, for the last four years. We, the people living and owning property adjacent to Sunset Ridge, find that we have had no representation and have not been informed that it had been decided that Sunset Ridge is planned to be an active park. Louis Greeley never thought so. He thought it was going to be a passive city park where we go in the evening and walk. Particularly trained between six to 8,000 young soccer players accommodating Costa Mesa, Santa Ana, and other areas. None of the planners of the park, as you see it here, and the people involved to bring this project to your knowledge here, live in the neighborhood. None other than uh, a far neighbor, which is Mr. Rosansky himself. He has to live there because he's a member. The plan developed so far is not acceptable. Many reasons have been cited by various people and must be evaluated and considered by this council. The open forum meetings held in recent months made clear that our city council representative did not represent his constituents and declared that the decision to have an active park was made. That has, in every, in every meeting, has it been said that it's going to be an active park, whether you like it or not. It's a fait accompli. Who decided that? It is therefore that I, on behalf of the people, as to ask the city to, the city council, disregard the idea of an active park and to consider people and constituents' desire. The passive park for the good of the neighborhood and future park of the Orange County River Park, including Banning Ranch. That's where the space is for your sports park, not here. This lot is not big enough to build a sports park. And it, it is a, you're not even prepared to plan because you have not had an evaluation of the lot. Recently they drilled right in front of my balcony up there. They drilled eight feet down and the water gushed out. It's an obvious reason that's underneath that area where the parking lot is. There is a lake underneath there. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the greenery there. It would be as barren as the rest of it. Anybody that knows land would know that. This property has not been evaluated. It is, I heard the price mentioned $500, $5 million. If I could get one, I would buy it too. If you buy a piece of land like this and you don't know how many oil wells were in there and they're never covered, it could be polluted. Have you had an analysis of the land? No. How can you make a plan of something that you know what it is? On the open meetings, I asked, where is the parking going to be? Well, we, we park on the other side on the, on the Banning Ranch. 
I said, have you made arrangements to get in through the Banning Ranch? No, we were in the discussion. Nothing is, you know, you have no egress, no access on this, on this lot. So all by itself, it is nothing and cannot be a sports park. It must be attached to the Banning Ranch, and I know you have made a, an ad hoc committee to investigate the Banning Ranch acquisition, which has happened nine years ago when the three cities, Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, and uh, Costa Mesa put some money up for a study. Okay, uh, uh, your time's up. Can you wrap okay. up, please? Thank you for listening to me. Okay. I hope you consider what I said. Okay, thank you. It should not be a sports park. Thank you very much. And you may have, this is the site out of my backyard. It's not the best picture, but it shows you the, the point where they drilled, and it shows you where they already started to take the trees out and eradicated all the habitats in there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Any other speakers? Good afternoon, Mayor Selich and council members. My name is Mike Lombardi. I live at Seven Landfall Court. And all that has been said, I was going to say. Thank you. You did it for me. I would like to reiterate a few points, however. Um, reading something from the paper recently um, and quoting someone here at the uh, as councilman's seats, uh, we're sensitive to the fact that there are residents who live nearby and we want to minimize the impact a park would have on them. My interest is to know what your concerns are and what the impact that you feel is going to have on us. Obviously, you feel there is an impact. The major impact that I feel is noise. Noise is going to be going through this complex uh, unstopped. I'm an old, uh, old, former elementary school administrator for the past, uh, well, for 18 years, and I know what kids do. And one of the other factors that we're talking about here is the safety of kids who are very precocious and just don't think when they're playing sports, they don't think when they're coming downstairs, they don't think when they're going across the street, and someone said this already, very concerned about the safety of those kids. This park is quite unique. Uh, I have played softball, senior softball, at several parks throughout the county here. Um, there is no park that I play in that has this proximity to buildings. It's right down from that wall to that wall away from the park itself, that soccer field. From that wall to that wall, close. That's going to be an awful lot of noise, ladies and gentlemen. The parks I play in have a lot of buffer area around them. Mariner's Park, I went over to look at that a few weeks ago. Uh, the houses that are close to that, close to that are across the street and over uh, maybe 100 feet, 200 feet. Uh, the other section of uh, Mariner's Park, uh, the homes there are, uh, there's a parking lot, there's a street, there's a drainage ditch, and then the houses begin. Uh, it, this is, as I said, uh, in the past, we're trying to put a size 8 shoe on a size 10 foot. There is just too much compacted into this one park. It's just, as you can see, it's just we're trying to accommodate all kinds of needs. Uh, one other suggestion I might have is to take the parking lot and there is an area rented that or leased it from the uh, Banning Ranch people uh, for storage of pipes and uh, uh, vehicles that do repairs. That would be an ideal parking area right in that. I'm sure you could access that and accommodate that. That would also be very, very close to the entrance into the parking lot as well as the exit. Uh, without can having you to... uh, wrap it up, sir? Your time's expired there. I I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Irwin. Uh, I live uh, in Kilo Court, which is uh, which is inland of the pool there. So I don't, I'm not going to be affected as uh, closely as these other people. I used to live in uh, the Beach House Apartments, and uh, before that, which is right next to that, and before that I lived on 37th Street. But the last five or six years, I've been able to come across the park quite a few times, just in recreation, either running or a lot of times I'll just come to this point right here. And, um, I know I. 
I'm just begging the city council to please go visit that point. You'll naturally go visit it, I think, if you went to the park is a few times before you make any decisions about this piece of land. Because like the last five or six years, I've just, I don't know, I really I, I fall in love with the land because there's a lot of reasons. But one is that it's so rare to have a hillside on top of an ocean with wildflowers. And so right now, you're not going to see any of those because they put poison on it about six weeks ago, and they, they cut it all out, the entirety of it. But it'll grow back very soon because that's such as the power of nature, but, but not if they permanently put the whole thing grassy. I also just want to say it's called Sunset Ridge Park, and this will, this will take away your view of the bay from that piece of land. That's one of the best things about that point. This wall is such that once, once you cross once, anywhere to the north from this wall inland, you won't see the bay because you have, this is high, just like this is, this ridge right here, and you have a ton of Indians, these buildings go right up to this ridge. So if you lower this right here, you're not going to be able to see the bay. You're not going to be able to see any of this. And a lot of that is like seven miles of, uh, of the peninsula. So you have a bay view, a peninsula view, and you have a northern view right from that point. I just think that's the highest value of land for the overall city. I mean, people coming to that point and enjoying the sunset view, or even in the morning, whenever, that's what brings the most value to the city. And, uh, and I just think the city, ought, the council should preserve the ridges all along because it creates like an oasis effect where the streets are down below in the canyon and you're above it to, to sit there and to go from here where you're looking down on the rip to the road to where you're down here and you can see the road, you're going to see it, hear it, smell it, taste it. All, all this plan of sloughing the slopes, it just brings the street into the park and the park's small enough. Um, you know, but it has kind of inspired me and I would say, it's my last point, that you know, if you're going to do terracing, I would just terrace a little bit, like right here, you know, and the people can enjoy their terraces. And all this, I mean, it's just natural to go out there. This thing is just stay wildflowers, you know. You know, it's such a rare thing. And all this you can save wildflowers too. Maybe it's a little soccer field, or big soccer field in the middle, you know, like right in the middle, hopefully, of the wildflowers, you know, past the wildflowers. And, and the top ridge will just mostly stay the same, I think. And yeah, the parking lot down below. I mean, thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public portion and um, bring it back to City Council. Councilman Rosansky. Well, I, as we were going through this, I was jotting down some notes of some of the issues or questions that people had. And since you're all here, I'm hoping to, I, I know we're a little pressed for time, but to just quickly go through the list and hopefully address or answer some of them and, <clears throat> and then the rest of the council can have a stab at it. First one I have down here, trees too tall, that was an issue. Certainly that's an issue in a lot of areas of town. We're actually facing it across the street with Hogue Hospital. <clears throat> and I believe that the, the tree specimens that we'll be calling out for that area will, will be sensitive to the heights. We're not talking about putting in 50 or 60 foot trees. We're talking about little trees that will stay little and, and will not naturally grow into the viewplane. So hopefully we can avoid those, those issues. The parking lot, as far as it being 75 spots, is it big enough? I mean, that's why we've hired experts to to who do this. That's their bread and butter. That's what they do. And if it's certainly, I'll tell you right now, if it's not big enough, make it big enough. You know, I mean, that's, I agree. We don't want people crossing Superior. We don't want them crossing Coast Highway. We don't have, want them parking in uh, Newport Crest. We want them to park at the park. It's not a place where, you know, we have a lot of side streets where, you know, like Mariners, where you could kind of park on the side streets and, you know, if the parking lot is full. So, Obviously, we need to be sensitive to that, and I think the consultant will be. Um, as far as um, <clears throat> baseball uh, conflicting with soccer, that is a problem. Baseball basically uses the field in, in the spring. Um, soccer is more of a fall and a spring sport. Um, again, that may be a reason to downsize the field a little bit um, and create a, a better situation. But again, we have people over in our Parks and Rec Department that work with both the soccer people and the baseball people to apportion out our fields and to determine what's fair and what's not fair so that everybody will have equal access to our fields. And so we're kind of working through that process now. And whether it'll be baseball and soccer or just soccer only or nothing. I mean, certainly there's a lot of people here tonight that would prefer to have just a pass a park with no fields. That decision hasn't been made yet, but will be soon. Um, park hours, you know, I don't know what we, and maybe Wes can comment on that, what we experience as park hours in our other parks. Can you quickly comment on that? 
what we're able to do in using, uh, in working with the users that have the field assigned to them, and we meet every six months to go through that, is, is we will ask them to schedule games so that there's a gap between, and that they don't begin too early and that they finish before it gets too late, and that so many teams only are on the, on the park at one given time, and they're very cooperative with that, and we have park patrol, which goes out and keeps an eye on that because they know the schedule too and the coaches have all gotten to know our park patrol guys and, and it's actually working quite well. I heard those concerns also and I know that soccer and baseball were sincere in the, when the leadership said that they would work with the community and be sensitive to that and not just run the place rampant once it got there. What about opening and closing hours typically of our parks in town? Because, I mean, a good chunk of this park is not just ball fields. I mean, there's obviously right. trails and sitting areas and things like that. There'll be other users besides Little League and soccer. As far as assigned or permitted uses, we can take care of that with the walkways that you see. In other words, the park is actually getting used now, mm -hmm. even in the evenings, maybe even after dark. As far as pedestrian or just one or two people going into the park for the view, that, that will continue on. But scheduled group use, permitted do, use, we could control that and limit it uh, depending on what the council wants to do. Do, do we that. have a set opening and closing hours for our parks? They, they, they vary, but basically... So it, it can vary? Yes, it can. It's not just blanket for the whole city? Correct. Great. Okay, uh, thank you, Wes. I thought I heard one of the sports gentlemen indicate that uh, their normal Saturday uh, baseball and, uh, and soccer games start at 9 o'clock. Isn't that Well, that is right? their normal game, and, and some even begin earlier than that, and there's practices. But when it comes to this specific project and in talking with those users, they're very open to working with what will make it happen. As far as uh, just further down my list here, the, some people express an interest in moving the parking lot closer to the entrance from PCH. Unfortunately, we don't own that land. That's Banning Ranch land. Um, I've met with the people, uh, owners of Banning Ranch on numerous occasions to discuss access into the park, and they've been very gracious in, in talking to us about that, and I fully believe that they will be cooperative in providing that access ultimately when we need it. Um, however, they're not interested in selling off little bits and pieces of Banning Ranch. That's, that's an absolute non-starter for a number of reasons unrelated to this park. But uh, they're not looking to piece it out and to expect that they're going to just give us a piece of land or even sell us a piece of land where we can put our parking is, is not reasonable and it's just not going to happen. And, so, uh, and we cannot build a park without owning our own parking or having parking in perpetuity for the park. So I just don't see that happening. Um, we're, we talked a little bit about access off of Coast Highway and the right in, right out. I think we covered that with the discussion about hopefully we'll gain control of the highway. Um, certainly we'll do our best to work with Caltrans to get a light at that uh, point on Coast Highway to make it as safe as possible. And actually I had safety as my last item because several people talked about it, but I'll talk about safety. You know, we're all parents, like I said, Sorry, Leslie. <laughs> I think we're almost all parents up here. We all have kids. We all want our kids to be safe. She has nephews and nieces, though I know that she wants to be safe. And we're not looking to design a park that's going to be an attractive nuisance or create issues. We have other parks that front onto busy streets. Bob Henry Park uh, is on Dover. Uh, Mariner's Park is on Irvine Avenue. And, you know, unless someone is going to show me wrong, I don't see throngs of kids being run over by cars. I mean, I, you know, for the most part, I, you know, my kid was in Little League and, and, and team sports as well. It's a pick-up and drop-off thing. I wish, you know, we should only hope that our kids would ride bikes and walk a little bit more. Maybe we wouldn't have the obesity problem we have with youth. But the reality of it is, is at a park like this, most of them will be picking up and dropping off. We've provided trails or access ways off of Superior. There's at least two before you even get to the intersection. There would be no need for them to even come down to that intersection. You know, east of there, there's really not that many homes to begin with, certainly a Togue Hospital there. So I don't really see a lot of people crossing Superior. There are some homes, Lido Sands down on the peninsula, and, you know, obviously we'll have to, to the extent that we need to upgrade that intersection, we will if we have to. But we will keep our youth safe. I can, I promise you that. We will not do something that will um, um, put them at peril. Um, as far as uh, lower backstops, you know, certainly those are issues that are, are solutions we can explore, or backstops that go up and down. But, you know, the problem is, as they mentioned in Costa Mesa, they just leave them up. They only put them in the pulleys systems to, in the event of a 60-mile-an-hour wind. And, you know, 
And we may get those too sometimes in Coast Highway, and it, it relies on groups to do that. But as most of the people here talked about, it's not just the view, it's the noise. And the problem with the way that that layout is there now is it drives the top lot where it's supposed to be, it drives the restrooms where they're supposed to be, it puts a, a baseball field right up against those residences there. And so those are the other issues. It's not just the netting and it's not just the poles. It's, it's the fact that the layout is being driven by the size of that field and where it has to be located. And so, again, I, you know, I understand the concerns of baseball that they you know, ideally like to have a Pony League field there. But, again, we may have to look at other fields in town to maybe enhance um, in lieu of doing that here. Um, as far as another man, man mentioned, uh, dust and the use of the field. You know, I only hope that the field gets a lot of use. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we've batted around, no pun intended, is uh, to put in potentially artificial turf there so we don't have to worry about the issues of, of overwatering, of pesticides being applied, of maintenance issues, of, of uh, unsightly fields where you're going to have brown areas or dust blowing into your homes. So that may be one solution. It's actually quite expensive. Um, it would be a, a major upgrade for that area, for that field, but something that we could look at. Um, and then and someone else mentioned, I'm almost done here, the due process, that uh, we haven't had due process. Well, I beg to differ. We had a significant, well, first of all, I want to, I'll just hold up an article here that was given to me. This is the Saturday, April 12, 1997, Daily Pilot. So we're talking about 11 years ago. There's a quote by Jan DeBay, my predecessor, or one of my predecessors, says there are just not enough parks in the west part of town. We have beaches, but not enough playing fields and things for children. And clearly she speaks about having, you know, active fields or ball fields. So this is not something new. It didn't just come up that this is not going to be a passive park. This is going to be an active park. It's been talked about that way for a long, long time. And we've had uh, many outreach meetings with our general plan process. It took years to develop that general plan process where we developed this uh, general plan and land use element that shows uh, this parcel is being an active park. Uh, we've had uh, two meetings that I've been at, uh, hosted by the uh, WES and, and EPT to talk about designs for the park, to get your input. We, have, we had a park speech and recreation committee meeting. We're having this meeting, and we're going to probably have another six or seven or eight meetings before we're done with this thing. So to say that there hasn't been due process, I think, is, is really uh, is, is not true. And lastly, I'll, I'm going to address this gentleman's come, Wildemar, I don't remember if that was your first or last name, saying that I have not been in touch with the residents of, of, of the area. That is completely false, and I really I take offense at that. When I became a councilman here four and a half years ago, one of the first, one, it was probably the very first phone call I got was from Louise Greeley because she wanted to start lobbying me about the park and bring, bring me up to speed on what was going on. And she graciously invited me to her home, and I went and visited her home, and she showed me the view. And over the years, I worked with Louise and anybody else who approached me who wanted to talk about the park and the park issues. My focus was on getting that piece of property for the city. Quite honestly, I was ignorant when I got on city council. I thought we already owned it. And so it was to my surprise when I became a city councilman that realized, well, hey, we hadn't closed the deal with Caltrans. And so, you know, I worked for three years. I took a couple trips up to Sacramento. I sat in on many meetings in order to achieve the, the goal of acquiring this piece of property. And once we passed that threshold, I've worked with members of the community. I've worked with the West Newport Beach Association. I've worked with Louise. I've worked with other community members. I've worked with the, as recently as uh, the Lombardies when I went and visited their home. To, so to say that I have not been representative of the people in this area is, is totally false. And so I would hope that you would reconsider your thoughts on that subject and talk to some of these other people, and maybe you'll get the right uh, information. With that, I'll turn it over to the rest of the council. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Gardner. Um, I had a question about the sound wall. There was a concern about the sound wall being lo lowered. Is that part of the, of the plan? The draft concept shows the thought that if we did remove the sound wall, it would be replaced with mounding and berming that would be just as high and yet more dense and okay. probably more effective in the sound abatement thereof superior. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Hen. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I, had, I, I have to say on the parking adequacy, it, it does just intuitively seem to me that that's not very much parking, but I, at the end of the day, 
I am uh, happy to rely upon the experts that the city employs to make those sorts of estimates. I'm guessing that the parking adequacy could change depending upon how the use of the land is programmed. Um, I do have a bit of a concern about the issues raised by the residents about uh, privacy and access uh, to their immediate property right from the park. And so I'd encourage the concept uh, planners here to see if there is, uh, are attractive ways to discourage access immediately into Newport Crest from the park and access to the park by people who park in the wrong place, that is, the, try to poach parking off of Newport Crest. It seems to me that there must be ways to do that that don't seem too uh, ugly or obvious but still afford uh, those homeowners a bit more privacy and security, by the way. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't get the impression, Wes, that we really tried to do a strategic rebalancing, if you will, of our programming of our parks on the thought that this would become a, a uh, younger age group use for baseball. And along with that strategic rebalancing exercise, whether or not there are opportunities to enhance other parks that, that could help with the 13, 14 year old age group. Uh, I, have we really exercised our minds about that? Just stood back from the whole web of parks that we've got and tried to think through another a little more strategic approach? Is, it, is there value in trying to do that now? In, in answer to your final question, I think there is value in that. I, uh, we looked at this, we've talked with the groups. When you look at Bob Henry and even the use of Ensign and Mariners, those are primary fields. Throw in Sunset Ridge, it's probably a look. That has been talked about as we've gone through the outreach, through the four meetings. It's been talked about before, during, and after meetings. But we didn't bring those ideas here tonight as part of what you asked for. We wanted to be true to what the request was and stay there for now. Leaving here tonight, if that's something the council thinks uh, we should do, and I think there is at least value in having that discussion once or twice, I think it's an idea that we should probably look at. And if that includes spending some money at these other parks to, make, to help that process along, I think we should identify that and give us a chance to make that decision, you know. Uh, is that a worthwhile trade-off? Uh, in favor of the homeowners in the area here. Uh, I, I do worry about that intersection of PCH and Superior. Uh, you know, I run regularly. I'm in pretty decent shape. <laughs> I'm telling you, crossing that Pacific Coast Highway at Superior there, that is a long way across with high-speed traffic. And so I, I only have a concern and no suggestion here, but I'm assuming that our staff is going to do a serious exploration of enhancing the pedestrian safety in that area because I think if this is developed as an active park, it will attract more pedestrian traffic back and forth across PCH there and maybe Superior too, I don't know. Um, you know, the other, the last, one last thought is uh, I've never seen it. I don't know if it's available, but I would like to at least have an exploration of whether or not there are retractable backstops that could function here, even if it's for the smaller tots. Uh, if we reprogram it in that direction, that could virtually eliminate that uh, sightline issue. I am, I do, I am concerned about the noise. If there is a way to reprogram the design of this to reduce the noise impact on the residents, that would be a good thing. That's all I have. Councilman Curry. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, coming out tonight. This has been very informative to me. I've been up in the property a couple of times and have walked around and uh, from both sides. I've learned things uh, tonight that I didn't know and I thought it was, uh, was very, very helpful. Uh, first of all, I think the idea for a memorial to Louise Greeley at the park is an excellent idea, and I hope that we pursue that as we look at the design and the layout of the park. I think we had some very good comments and suggestions on trees and about how we can design or, or, or select trees in terms of uh, making sure that they don't grow into the view plane and that they're appropriately topped and, and we maintain the height of the trees as they go into the, to the park. Uh, the parking and access issues, particularly as Councilmember Hen has raised, I also share that concern about making sure that we don't create opportunities for parking violations in the neighborhood and that those are dealt with through a, a parking management strategy that uh, directs the traffic to the parking lot and away from the neighborhood from, for park users. 
I think the, I was very pleased to see the, uh, the receptivity on the part of, our, of the baseball community to look at how we can design the backstop either in a component way or through a, through a net kind of structure that minimizes its input, its impact on views. They were thinking about lowering it. There's perhaps ways similar to how they run the net up when people kick field goals in pro football of maybe having a retractable kind of net. So let's look at the technological op uh, options that are available to us as we, as we look at that and continue to get uh, additional community feedback on this matter. Councilman Webb. Yes, uh, one of the issues that somebody brought up was on security. Could you go through to your typical sections, your cross sections? If you notice, on, um, on most of these, there's a couple places where it's a lot less, but you have about a six or eight foot tall wall yes, that would make it a little difficult unless you have a ladder to get through. Now, there's several places where, uh, do a, a couple more sections where you can see, but that wall is fairly consistent along the entire area. Uh, this as I remember is probably, it's either here or right up there, which uh, is a very convenient way to get into the park. And that's something that uh, uh, if it became a significant problem as far as access, could easily build a, build a, uh, a fence. Could you go back down to the, to the other exhibit? The, the, the last one, I mean the, the park, the, the overall design. It's one of the things, now I, only have 38, 38 years of experience living across the street from Mariner's Park. And yes, the street right away is 60 feet wide and the front yard setback is 20 feet, so that's 80 feet. And then the backstop over in the school area is another 20 feet. So I am maybe 100 feet from the, the baseball. Diane, I know Dr. Vanderslitz's kids have played over there from time to time because I chased him out of parking in front of my house. But. <laughs> <laughs> But the way this park is set up, it's set up to minimize the number of people that are there at any one time. It's set up to where you have one baseball game going along, there's not enough room for soccer. So that uh, the gentleman said, well, you got 24 people, uh, and if, if all of the parents drive separately, that's 24 parents. And let's say that you have 24 more parents come for the next game, that's uh, another 40, uh, 24, 48 people. Uh, then we still have another 30 spaces for those people that are just kind of wanting to wander around. So I think that from the standpoint of, of uh, and I think you look the same way, you have one major soccer game going on. You, you have this area set up for either the uh, kiddie soccer, and that's where you might have a few more people than, than uh, the, the baseball, but uh, 80 spaces is probably not that far off. I know that Mariner's Park doesn't have parking spaces. You park around the edges. And uh, I've, on occasions when I couldn't park in front of my house, I counted and it looked like to me there was about 70 or 80 cars that were parking around Mariner's Park, and that's a lot larger park use than this one. As far as noise is concerned, I really have not, I think mean, this is from experience, I really have not had a problem with uh, exceptional early morning noise because it only happens on Saturdays uh, that they have the, the youth games. Uh, again, I live across the street from the school too and I get a lot of kids going to and from school. They're on that playground all day long and, it, and I'm retired so I spend a lot of time at home. And the thing that I enjoy most about being next to a park is I can walk out and pick up the paper in the morning and there's this beautiful green grass area out there and that I don't have to take care of, right? <laughs> and and the, the noise situation is, yes, I'll admit when you get a very active soccer team and you get the parents cheering because their kids just made a goal, yes, you're going to hear noise. And that's going to be on your Saturdays and, and, and that's going to be the noisiest time. I think that the, the evening practices, which are going to be the four to s till sunset type time frame, you don't get that much noise. I don't, I don't envision noise as being the major, a major problem here. I think that uh, from my experience in working with the city before I got on the city council, 
I know that uh, I've worked with Louise Greeley as long as anybody here because that was one of the jobs I had was to coordinate and, and she knew very well that this was going to be an active park in order to get the support to buy it, in, in my opinion. I know that had you asked her would you prefer to have an active park or a passive park, she would have said I want a passive park. But she knew in order to get the support for the city council over the years that she got and she worked very, very hard over all of those years to, to get the city council interested in this project. And finally, I think Steve Rosansky can take a lot of credit because when he did come on the council, he says, well, why haven't we bought this? And well, we've been dealing with Caltrans and they haven't wanted it. But he really pushed the issue and did, an, in my opinion, an excellent job of getting this council together in pushing for the legislation that it took to get Caltrans to sell the property to us. And I know that in my experience on the council, I have never considered this as anything other than an active park. And I think that uh, uh, we need to, to sit back a little bit and, and try not to look at what the worst things that can happen are, but let's look at some of the good things that can happen related to this is a park. Let's listen to people having fun. Let's go out and join them and have fun too. I, I, I just think this is, is going to be a, a great location and I think that if we center on all of the what ifs that we're going to, to never do anything in this town again. I really believe that this is an opportunity for us. We can say yes, let's put it in Banning Ranch. The Banning Ranch will be lucky to have a facility available for us if we develop, if a developer develops it in 10 years. If it's acquired, it may take longer than that because I'm not sure how we're going to get three or four hundred million dollars to, to buy the property, but that's another issue too. So I, I think that we will need the Banning Ranch parks will give us probably what we need to have over on this side of the town ultimately, but we can't delay this project in anticipation of getting the Banning Ranch because that's too far from now. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Daigle? Uh, real briefly, I uh, certainly heard some concerns that need to be addressed, and I think many of them can be addressed, and I'd emphasize that it is a fluid design process, and I think we can accommodate um, some changes. I think we also need to um, continue the outreach, and as someone who lives next to a high school, I live next to Corona Mar High School, I can confirm your thinking that noise is, is something that comes up, and, and certainly there's some uh, new treatments now, for example, with the Hogue project, they're looking at those Caltrans, a kind of a vinyl egg carton type of a wall that seems to be pretty effective. So, so maybe there are some additional uh, methods to mitigate the noise that we can look at as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know how much more I can add to what's been said already. Um, I've been on the City Council and Planning Commission for 13 years now, and ever since I got on the the Planning Commission back in 1995. This has been designated as an active park. I've been through two uh, major updates and rewrites of the city's parks, open space and recreation element. Every one of those has designated this as an active park. Uh, so it certainly shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Um, I think that that's been our priority. Um, it's what's needed. I think that we have a, a balanced plan here. I, uh, in concept, I think it's a good plan. I am sensitive to the issues that the residents that live adjacent to this park uh, have brought up, and I won't go through all of those. I think Councilman Rosansky did a pretty good job of that. Those are mostly design issues that can be worked on as we go through and refine this concept plan and uh, work out the details. I think the one, the major thing that concerns me is, the, is losing that uh, baseball field. Um, I'd like to see us see if we can do whatever we can to deal with the backstop and have a drop down backstop or the overhead thing, whatever we can do within reason to minimize the view impact. I don't know that if you take a look at the whole breadth of that park, that's really that significant an issue. We're kind of dealing with the same thing in Marina Park where we're doing some buildings and uh, the people that live right across from those buildings are objecting to the placement of the buildings, but yet on each side of the buildings, there's a lot of view area and there's 
there's a broad view across this property, and I don't know that those uh, the backstop area is really going to be that much of an impediment, particularly if it's uh, you know it's see-through material or it's something that drops down. So I would hate to see us compromise the uh, the, uh, the the needs of baseball to um, um, try and deal with that issue when when there are probably other ways that we can deal with it from a design standpoint. Um, other than that, I, I think that the, uh, the other issues that have been brought up are things that can be dealt with through, uh, through design and as we go through and refine this process. And I guess what's going to happen now, uh, Mr. Morgan, is this is going to go back to the Parks and Recreation Commission. There will be further meetings on this? That, that is correct. And hearing the seven council members' comments so that we leave here tonight and not take missteps and everybody else understands where we're going and just let me go through a little bit so I get it right and, and not get it and go off in the wrong direction. If you want us to just continue to focus on Sunset Ridge and work on that backstop and go with a 20 to 25 foot netted apparatus that drops down out of the view plane, we will do that. If you, if you want us to work with baseball and soccer on maybe looking at a little wider look, we can do that. We'll at least have that discussion. We'll work with EPT and we'll go back to PBNR and some combination of those discussions and working with baseball, because baseball does drive this. I, I really believe Councilmember Rosansky is right about that. He dri that drives the design and the view easement line. Uh, we'll come back to you again probably in study session shortly. We'll have these meetings quickly over the next few weeks and come back to you with something a little different than you've seen tonight that addresses everything that's been said, takes into, into consideration all of your comments, and, and see what you think of it. So I think we've got enough direction that we know where to go here, at least for the next step or two, and then get back to you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of the council staff? Okay, thank you all for attending the meeting. We appreciate your comments. Move on to our next agenda item, which is the, um, the traffic signal communication master plan peer review. Um, how long is your presentation on this, Mr. Bader or Mr. Webb? Uh, we could probably shorten it up quite a bit and maybe just get right to uh, Mr. Faust's report. Okay, why don't we do that? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, it's a pleasure for me to be here. My name is Joe Faust. I'm a principal of the firm. You have to speak up, Joe. we got some noise coming out here. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, my name is Joe Faust. I'm a principal of the firm Austin Faust Associates. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I, I thought I was going to get to talk to traffic to the whole crowd, so uh, I appreciate your tolerance and uh, 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 sticking to it. It's, I know it's difficult to hear that subject and now come up and talk about traffic. Um, <clears throat> what I uh, have done for you uh, is taken an independent peer review of uh, your traffic signal communications master plan. Uh, uh, you've had a lot of good people and a lot of time working on a, a report and a, a system, and I think it's a, a system that you desperately need. For example, uh, your existing uh, traffic control system is uh, probably on the order of 30 years old. Uh, the hardware is obsolete and out of date, and uh, there's 150 signals in town. Uh, uh, several of them being Type 170 or Caltrans controller that that system can't even communicate with. So 20-25% uh, 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 of the signals in town, uh, your master com uh, uh, controller can't even understand what's going on. So my first conclusion is, as, as is finding, it, uh, finding in the report, is the replacement of the uh, existing uh, equipment and hardware is uh, justified and is needed, um, sorely so. Um, the process went and looked at several uh, different uh, types of equipment. Uh, it, uh, cutting to the chase here, it, it uh, optimized and selected an um, uh, Econolite system, one I'm quite familiar with. Uh, they're local here. Uh, their system is called ICONS. It is a state-of-the-art system, and so uh, it, it's uh, good equipment, reliable equipment. The manufacturer of that equipment is local here, and, and the uh, uh, experts and the team that you got working on it are also local here. So you've got the consultants and, and the people that are going to implement it uh, here. You've got this uh, very reliable supplier and uh, manufacturer here, and, and, and they have both have long track records. Uh, that said, uh, in looking at the value of this system, 
Uh, the hardware, although state-of-the-art, uh, will depend largely on taking another step in, in terms of the evolution of uh, uh, ITS, the Intelligent Transportation System, the buzzword of the day. And, and I'm suggesting that that next step is in uh, surveillance or the installation of closed-circuit television cameras. Um, <clears throat> the initial project has uh, a recommendation for two of those. Uh, in order to, to achieve uh, the 3 to 5 percent improvement in overall reduction of delay and, and increased performance, I believe it's going to take uh, uh, substantially more than, than two monitor, uh, closed circuit TV monitors to be installed. Uh, the recommendation identified in phase one, uh, a total of eight more to go in, three of those being uh, top priority and, and five of them being uh, secondary priority. I'm suggesting to you that that you have the, the beginnings of a very, very good system here. You need to uh, be more aggressive rather than less in terms of implementing uh, in, uh, the closed circuit or surveillance portion of that uh, program. One big reason for that is that the improvement that you're looking for is going to be largely come as a result of, of that uh, surveillance system. So if you don't have it, uh, very difficult to achieve much of an improvement over what you're already doing. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, closed circuit television surveillance uh, puts a tax onto your communication system, and, and uh, I, I'm a, it looks like fiber optics is going to be the direction that ultimately you're going to have to go. So, uh, again, I'm suggesting that step up the, uh, the conversion from the city's uh, system of some hardwired, uh, twisted wire pairs. Uh, uh, implement the backbone of, of uh, fiber optics as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Once again, I realize I'm suggesting you spend more money, not less, but you, you, you've got a good system here, and it takes this additional investment to get the most bang for the buck. And the final uh, conclusion or recommendation that I have is that in order to make this system more efficient and really tax it, you're going to have to do some, some serious before and after evaluations to determine the timing plans because the, the basis of this system is timing plans that have been developed offline are in the computer's memory and it compares the existing traffic counts with optimized traffic patterns and implements the best of those. So if it doesn't have good plans in, in its memory, you can't achieve good results. So the before and after will tell you if you have good correlation between actual field conditions and the, the traffic plans that are implemented. So uh, what I'm saying is that it, it will be incumbent on doing some, some serious before and after evaluation of the timing plans that you implement with the new system. Those are kind of, uh, I spent a lot of nights uh, reading this. I've been through every page of it. Uh, some of it gets very technical into uh, IT. Uh, Communications. I'm, I don't sell myself as an expert uh, on that area, but I, I'm a working man. I understand from the traffic engineer's perspective how having these tools available to you can make the transportation much better. And the system I'm suggesting to you is this tool, but you need to really tax it by add these add-ons and expediting or stepping up the, the process of implementing the uh, surveillance and, 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 and the before and after evaluation. So. Uh, I, I hope, or I think you probably have a lot of questions. I'll, I'll try to keep it as, I'll try to answer those briefly. Okay, Mayor Pro Tem Daigle. Uh, yes, Mr. Faust, I wanted to thank you for um, undertaking this review. I know you've had a very long association with the city of Newport Beach. And based on um, your recommendations, I wanted to let you know that I did sit down with our traffic engineer and our new deputy director, I also talked to our IT and our fiber person, and I want to thank them for the proficiency by which they have responded to um, some of your ideas. And I just wanted to um, touch on a couple of points. Um, you talked about um, performance testing, and this would seem to um, give our technology people the ability to look at more information so we can make more adjustments uh, in, in more uh, real time. And can you expand a little bit on what performance testing looks like for this type of a system? Well, the performance testing, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, 3 to 5 percent overall improvement here, and that's not a, a great deal. Uh, I mean, 
10 or 15 percent, three to five percent doesn't sound like a lot, but it can turn out to be very significant in terms of a, of a three to five percent uh, reduction in delay in the peak hour travel times or d uh, reducing the delay. And in order to achieve that, it's going to take a lot of data to be collected, a lot of offline computer programs uh, uh, to optimize the, the signal timing patterns that the, 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 the system implements. In other words, as the detectors on the street count the volume of traffic, they're going to go back into their uh, memory banks and look to say, okay, under these conditions, what's the best timing plan that we can put in? Well, that's theoretical at this point. What I'm suggesting is that before and after will tell you the reality. Was that timing, did it achieve the, the improvement that you were looking for, or do we need to tweak this a little bit more? I mean, it's, it's <coughs> theoretically possible we could optimize a timing plan, call it up, and make matters worse. That's the last thing, of course, we want to do. But so the, the performance testing is to ensure that we are actually have developed offline timing programs to meet these various peak period or, and off-peak period conditions as well, and that those get implemented when uh, at a t uh, suitable times. Another area is in, uh, uh, for special events. Uh, <coughs> you could extend that even to uh, emergency uh, vehicle runs. I mean, you have the, the uh, uh, emergency vehicle uh, 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 devices on, on, the, on the fire trucks, but, but you could program in uh, emergency uh, timing into your signal system. Now, we're, we're going on to a very sophisticated level, you know, that's, that's maybe a little beyond the 3 to 5 percent. But those, the reason that I'm, I'm talking about the before and after evaluation is to essentially make sure that we're achieving that uh, uh, improvement that we, that, that the system is capable of and that, that we get that. Okay. And secondly, um, it's evident from your report and discussions with our staff that that the improvements come from the surveillance. And I know um, Councilman Webb met with all of us and it, it seemed as if, and I want to hear from staff later, what was discussed was to um, phase in earlier Marguerite uh, and then also some more cameras along uh, Jamboree, Jamboree PCH, and then I think it was Jamboree Bison. Um, yes, so I'm, we I'm had discussed that as possible improvements and then the underlying fi fiber that would support that. And one of the reasons I'm saying that the improvement is coming from the surveillance is, um, uh, I think I made the analogy to you uh, we were talking about is, it's, it's one thing to stand out on the street corner, you know, at, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and all this traffic buzzing around you. It's quite another thing to be in a helicopter and seeing the big picture. And what, that's what the, the traffic surveillance provides for you is the big picture on a number of locations. So. Uh, staff or, or a technician could could literally be in the transportation management center and be looking at several locations and seeing literally whether traffic is flowing or, or some leg is backing up or something like that and uh, either make some immediate adjustments or go into the, the programs and, and find out what's causing that or create another uh, traffic pattern to uh, replicate that condition. So being able to see this and the analogy I'll say is, is having your own little in, in, in City Hall helicopter that's flying around these lo critical locations is, is quite a tool okay. and very helpful. And two um, final points that I wanted to touch on. Um, as part of your review, um, you know, you indicated when the city goes from T1 to T3 lines, we might want to take a look at that. And having spoken with our IT director, we are in the process of weighing those kinds of costs against developing more of our network. We now have a tower that we can utilize and, and just building more fiber. So that is something that will be coming to the council in July that we're going to do some cost analysis on. Uh, yes, I was suggesting that uh, um, at, at some point you're going to have to replace twisted wire pairs. Uh, they can only carry so much data and closed circuit television and really real time closed circuit television has, is real data intensive. Uh, your T1 lines that are leased, uh, they're pretty much maxed out already, so you're either uh, going to increase your T1 lines to uh, uh, T3s or really fiber optics. So I'm suggesting that eventually, uh, I, I don't think anybody would argue that a fiber optics based system would be the, the best way to go or the way you would like to go. I'm just saying, well, get there as, as quickly, and I understand cost, but but, but you need to, to have an emphasis on getting that direction 
and, and I believe there are some patches that you don't have to do the whole city all at once to, to achieve this, but I think in the long term that's where you want to end up. And then my final point is that there are distinct conditions on the east side of the bay to the west side of the bay that uh, create what seems to be a disparity in these improvements. Um, however, we are um, citywide representatives, and, and I was wondering if you had any additional thoughts in terms of um, phasing in earlier improvements in Western Newport and, and this side of the Bay and Peninsula? Well, uh, in, in looking at there's an eight-phase plan and phases one, two, and three, which are really the first part, start out with um, uh, Coast Highway, Corona Del Mar area, then up uh, uh, Jamboree and, and, and uh, up to the airport, so three. Then phase four is uh, Irvine and Superior. So, uh, and, and there's not any funding, I mean, they're going to pursue it, but funding for, uh, if you want to call that, West, uh, uh, West Newport, uh, that's in phase four, and then phase five is, is back to Newport Center. I, I think that, I guess what I'm suggesting is uh, step up the whole program. In other words, uh, I, I'm not, I know that funding is, is really uh, an, an issue, but uh, being, being able to, to really make this eight-phase program a four-phase program or something like that. That's really what I'm talking about. In, in looking at, uh, there's seven of you and you have the priorities of this versus the town. When I looked at the eight phases, it kind of made some sense in the order that they were. But what I'm suggesting is just implement it rather than in eight phases. Uh, we got phase one, two, and three, so that leaves you five phases left. Make that two or three phases rather than, rather than five phases. Part of that comes from, uh, I've been around a, a lot more years and, than I like to broadcast, and um, you know, eight phase program can take a long period of time and, and there's interest and focus on it right now. Uh, five or six years from now, is there still the interest on an eight phase program or does phases seven and eight kind of drop off in their importance? So if, if you can, you know, hit it hard right now while the interest is there and there's a need and everybody sees it, that's kind of what I'm suggesting to you. Just step the whole program up uh, a notch. Okay. Councilman Webb? Yeah, I, on your before and after evaluation, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, you talked mainly about looking at the various different single timing programs uh, before and after. How do you evaluate the befores? Uh, do you put together 10 or 15 different scenarios and then uh, plug them into the computer at peak hours and watch what happens and uh, that's the year before and then uh, the after is well, when do we do this? I, I, I'm a little confused on, on well, how you actually physically do the before work. Uh, the, be, the before work is done before, well, you could start tomorrow. I mean, you got an existing system uh, out there today. You, you have uh, implemented some timing patterns back in 2003 and 4 and, and been updated all along. So there is a system that, that, that's there now. This, uh, so go out and measure it in terms of, of uh, basically the travel time to, to drive okay. various so, routes so through the city. You're talking about time delay studies where you time get, and delay studies you get for, somebody for, in a car that drives up and down the road about 15 times during peak hour and with a stopwatch and all that kind of stuff. That's part of it, yes. Okay, what's the other part? The other part is you put out traffic counters out here and you determine what the volume of traffic is. is uh, we're, we have running through there on peak 15 or, or 30 or uh, uh, 60 minute period. So you got time to, to make to go from point A to point B and you're probably going to have runs from A and B uh, C to D, E to F, several of them to be an honest compare, uh, determination of what the existing uh, travel time and delay on a citywide basis is and then uh, existing traffic counts to determine what the, the travel time or the volume you're achieving now. And then implement the various timing patterns that the new system is going and then simply do that all over again. Now the, your new system does have one other capability, and that is uh, I'm talking about going out and physically counting this, and yes, it is labor intensive in terms of collecting this data. But the new system then will also have the capability of simulating those flows. So you, you can also have not only actual real time travel time and delay, but you can simulate from a computer perspective, and it will give you a comparison of before 
and after. So you get a real time by driving the streets, and you get a simulated computer analysis, uh, theoretical although, but again, it's, it's very good. That's, We're using yeah. it all the time anymore. And that's the after condition. That's the yeah, after do, condition. Should we also be doing uh, ICU counts at the major intersections as a part of the before and after evaluation? Well, um, you do the ICU calcs uh, in terms of uh, your uh, TPO analysis, right. and so you're going to be doing that anyhow. Uh, in terms of uh, ICU, one of the, 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 the restraints of, of an ICU, it doesn't look at closely spaced at intersection. It assumes that a queue in a left turn pocket doesn't back out and block the number one lane or something. It stacks them vertically. So. Really, uh, the ICU analysis, you can perform that because it's simple enough to do with the data you got, but it's not going to tell you um, too much about the real flow of the traffic. That's where this, uh, either this closed circuit television or you can see if the, if, the, if the legs are backing up and if they, if they are, uh, ICU might not tell you that. That, that's what's happening in San Miguel and MacArthur because we have very low ICUs there showing we have acceptable levels of service, but we have a lot of congestion. Is that that's, sort of right? That's a, that w I hadn't thought of that one, uh, uh, Mr. Webb, but that, that's a good example of where it, it, it would be very beneficial to use the other type of before and after, not ICU, to compare that situation. <laughs> also, that would be an excellent place to put the camera overhead so you could see, that, you know, I mean, picture's worth a thousand words, I say, and you, you would see that if you were in a helicopter flying around as opposed at the intersection. I'm not sure you, it, you, you wouldn't get uh, uh, bedazzled by all this traffic that's going every which way. So. Okay, but the ITERIS re report in itself gave us a good recommendation for a system to implement, and you're, what you're really doing is saying let's, let's put a few more uh, surveillance devices on this to make it even better. Yes, Mr. Council, I'm saying I'm going to give them an attaboy, if you want, and just, just step up your, you know, let, let's go, let's get in a race car here, you know. Okay, I have a question for Dave. I notice in phase three that we're working on putting fiber optics in on Irvine Avenue between, uh, well, really between MacArthur all the way down to uh, uh, Santiago. We have under construction today with the county uh, the widening project on Irvine Avenue between Bristol and Mesa. Uh, do you know if there's fiber optics going to be installed as a part of that construction project? And if there isn't, can we work a change order with the county to go ahead and put that in? Uh, you caught me off guard on that. I don't know if that's the case. I'm, I'm guessing, as most of our program here, the, the gold is where the fiber goes. We'd be going back an existing signal conduit. We pull the copper out and put the fiber optic in. We surely can check to make sure we have a conduit in there. Um, it would be a, this is the opportunity I would imagine, and I don't, I don't remember. Well, I haven't gone through those plans. I don't think the county is, has plans for fiber optic, but I, I, it doesn't really do us any good to pull in the fiber optic now uh, without having the, the capacity to hook it up. Um, the conduit will be there. Okay, that that was the that's main the point. key. Is, the conduit the, will be. Is there. the conduit a part of that project? And if it isn't. <laughs> Can we have it installed? We'll talk to the county on that. Okay. Uh, Robin, we have a conference call at six. Is that a hard call, or is we have a little? No, that, that's flexible. Okay, Councilman Rosansky. Yeah, just a couple of quick comments or thoughts here. In your, Mr. Faust, in your report here, you talk about that this is a, a traffic responsive system as opposed to an adaptive system. You don't really. It, it seems like you, my impression is the adaptive system is somehow better. But maybe that's the wrong impression. So can you explain on, expand yes, on that well, a little bit? Well, first of all, let me uh, explain the difference between the two. A traffic responsive system is a system that has a series of optimized traffic patterns developed offline based on uh, when the volumes reach this level out on the street, we run it through computer opt uh, signal optimization uh, plans, and we come up with a optimum timing chart for a volume of traffic under those so you, conditions. So you have like a menu of different alternative yeah, timing well, patterns? Yeah, for best example is that we go, we go with 100% capacity of the intersection. At 75% capacity, we implement plan A. At 80% volume, we implement plan B, et cetera. Okay. Maybe we have a dozen plans depending on the volume of traffic. Uh, 
the traffic adaptive system is a real-time system. It's constantly looking at all the detectors, all the volume counts, and it's constantly adjusting the timing. It isn't looking at a previously or predetermined uh, set of timing patterns to implement. It says the optimum for right now is to do this, and it implements. So it doesn't have fixed background cycles. It doesn't have fi fixed splits or anything. It's almost a literally a minute-by-minute uh, evaluation so of the it's system. Like a, it's a smarter system? I mean, is that... It, it is, in that re regard, a smarter system, is it, yes. Does it provide better flows or traffic efficiency? I mean, would we expect 10% instead of 3 to 5%? No, uh, it, 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 well, uh, in terms of, of uh, traffic adaptive, and that's the, uh, for lack of a better description, I'm going to call it the smarter system, uh, you might gain another 3 or 4%. Is it significantly more? Over a well-tuned, and that's why I recommended the, the uh, before and after evaluations, a well-tuned traffic responsive system, the type of system that, that the ICON system right. that you're going to have. Which means so. we kind of have to, I mean, we can't just do it once. I mean, every year or so we got to periodically you, you do have to do that. So yes. why would we want to go with the adaptive system as opposed to uh, the other? A lot more expensive. Um, and it's... Um, like, we're, don't we're, say a lot more. Say, like, we're... We're talking about phase three or one, two or whatever it was a million bucks. So are we talking two million bucks? I, I would guess two million at least, probably, maybe as maybe three, but substantially more. The other is where, where would you see a system like that? Where would you? Um, uh, by and large, the city of Anaheim's uh, system is is like that, but but they got a lot of staff people, and so the other impact of the traffic. Uh, um, uh, adaptive system is a lot of maintenance, a lot of continuous surveillance, uh, a lot of staff costs, uh, on addition to just the initial investment. And that's been the large, biggest reason that they haven't, haven't actually gone forward. Now that type of system, uh, if you read the newspapers, uh, 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 mayor of Los Angeles, the governor, they are promoting that type of system, but they cost millions. So. And, and they, they, they haven't yet worked their way down to be affordable to, to the smaller cities. One other quick question. I don't know if it's for you or for Steve, but, I mean, assuming we wanted to go with more cameras and, and do the fiber just from the get-go, what kind of cost would we be talking about there? I, I didn't uh, I understand. It. I'm, yeah, I think no, the yeah, fiber I think, and all that. Yeah, I think that would be correct. It really, it's just a kind of accelerating what we're already planning on doing. Let me just raise a point there because maybe I'm missing something here. But looking at these maps, it looks like you know, as far as the backbone system, of course, what is missing is PCH past uh, Jamboree, and that's because it's a Caltrans system. So, are, are we saying that our phases are really kind of matching what is existing? And what isn't existing is PCH, that portion of PCH that belongs to Caltrans. So that's, it's kind of like the tail wagging the dog as far as what our needs are are, and establishing our priorities. I mean, is, is that a fair statement? Well, I, I, think, I think that is. I, I, you know, we're, we tried to look at the corridors that we could do first and get the most bang for the change. The first phase, we tried to kind of keep it somewhat simple. Um, realizing how important these traffic signal systems are. Um, it, it's like trying to teach someone to fly in a 747. You really want to start them out in the Cessna. The idea was really to, to kind of get our system in, get it up and running and optimizing. As Joe says, you know, you've got to fine tune it. So I think that was the reason why we, were, we weren't quite as aggressive in this first phase. We really didn't identify when those additional phases were going to move forward. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think for the purposes of, of the uh, consultant's report, they're split up in segments that made sense in corridors. Now, whether we do them all at once, uh, is, we could do that. We can do them in pieces. We can combine them. Um, that's something that's easily done. And as Homer pointed out, the, the big missing factor here is Coast Highway um, in, the, in the Caltrans area. And it's, uh, but, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to make that too big of an issue because we, we have a good working relationship with Caltrans, and 
we do see the opportunity to make it work in the interim and certainly um, and Dave and I have already met with Caltrans and started the discussions about what would it take for us to take control of those signals. One, one final comment um, as far as what you were talking about the phasing and, and that we need to get this going. I mean this is we have an eight phase program here but this is not really an eight phase program because we haven't addressed Coast Highway from Jamboree all the way to Huntington Beach or with the peninsula area or any of that and so um, you know, I'm looking at this as more like a 10 and 12 phase program. And so I agree with Mr. Faust. Um, I think we should be working towards getting this system of, I mean, traffic is our number one concern of our residents. Every time, every time, except for maybe the airport, traffic is number one. And, you know, we've been talking, I, I've been talking about it for four and a half years now. I don't feel like I've really voted on anything that's done any, some, anything really substantial in town to solve this problem. And I think that that is something that if we're going to be spending precious dollars on, then let's get them going towards this and get this thing in place. And, and I forget that term that you used, but drag racer here or whatever. I mean, we need to get speed racer here, not uh, pops racer. So thank you. Steve, quick question, because um, I, I think Mr. Faust confirmed that we have a very good system. So I think a lot of credit goes to our design. Um, this evening, what they seem to be suggesting, though, is if are, are you comfortable with a little bit more surveillance in phase two and three that we had discussed? Yeah, I, th okay. I think we are. I mean, we certainly can move forward with that, and we'll take those steps. If Sounds good. We've got our 747 like to go taken off here. Thank you. Councilman McCurry. I just want to make it right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, I would say, let's not get hung up on the phase, and I think we can, you know, just get her done. I, that's, I think, where we want to be with this, and we can move as quickly, I think, financially as, as you can make this thing work operationally. So we want to go in that direction. Now, let me ask, do we have existing fiber oper optic networks, or do we have, apparently it sounds like we have conduits some places in the streets uh, that are ready for it, or would all this have to be uh, laid new? I've read your report, and you you have a you have some fiber optics. You have some T1 lines. You're looking at perhaps upgrading those to T3 mm -hmm. lines, but suggest that even that might they might be at capacity in phase at the end of phase one or two. And you have some twisted wire pairs. So you you got everything, and and uh, it's probably a credit to your IT people that are making all of this work. But but I'm I'm suggesting let's work. Mm -hmm rapidly toward the fiber optic based system. So. And is fiber optic going to be the technologically optimized system or is there a potential for a wireless interface or other technology that would overtake that in the near future? Right now I don't think anybody is suggesting that fiber optics is not the best or, or would provide the uh, bandwidth that, that the systems that we're talking about and then you're going to be using right now. You're not going to overload a fiber optics based system. Uh, you are going to overload the twisted wire pair, or you're already overloading those. So uh, I don't. Th there's going to be some new technology come on. I, again, I'm not. That's not my expertise. But you know, we've seen, we've seen the last 20 years. I mean, we used to have uh, two. I remember when I started in traffic, we had two or three wires running bet between them. Now we got uh, tremendous communication capability. Uh, so. Um, I'm sure fiber optics 20 years from now, there probably will be a technology that's better than that. Uh, but your system, uh, if you had fiber optics right now with the uh, Econolite system and the icons and the equipment that you, uh, your uh, equipment would be uh, the uh, constraint, not, not the fiber optics communication or bandwidth. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Hen. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful that at some point we can stop talking about this 3 to 5 percent overall improvement and start talking about critical intersection improvement, which I'm hoping is going to be more noticeable to the, to the driver than a 3 to 5 percent improvement. If, if that's, are you saying that that's what the critical intersection improvement is going to be? Three to five percent. Uh, well, the overall system improvement overall. Now there could be an individual intersection that uh, might have a six or seven percent, and it's it's at least theoretical possible that that uh, some locations that are operating pretty well now might not be quite as well in order to optimize one of your yeah. critical locations and and do on the average better than three to five percent there, but on the system as a whole. I'm talking three to five percent. Okay, but when I'm driving in my car, it's not the system as a whole that I'm worried about. 
It's the critical intersection that makes me mad because I can't get through it. That's what people, that's what they viscerally react to on traffic. So I'm hopeful that we can get to a measurement that, you know, we can start talking about a little finer measurements of things that actually make a difference to drivers. And there's where I'm, I don't want to oversell the, the closed circuit cameras, but for example, uh, the, the, somebody in, in the traffic management center could go to one of these critical locations and they could be looking at that intersection and seeing are all the legs backed up, is everybody getting through, or is everybody running right. two or three cycles. If, if there's a leg that's, that's backing up and the, the rest of them aren't, change some of the timing patterns. If all the legs are backed up, maybe you need to do something on a system to, to re-divert traffic to a parallel route or something. So in terms of can this system respond to the, your individual intersection complaint? Absolutely. Okay. And that's, that's the value of the surveillance in it. As Councilman Rosansky pointed out, traffic is number one. It's traffic, traffic, traffic. That's what we need to make progress on as a council. And so we need to implement those additional cameras now and the fiber optics to support them now. I think that for two reasons. First off, in these first one or two or three phases, the public's going to be watching. Am I getting an improvement here? I'd like to be able to deliver as much perceptible improvement to the public as possible in the early phases. That's number one. And number two, we've talked about learning curves here before. I'd like to make sure that in those early phases, we get a good full understanding of what we can do with this system so that we can learn now and modify our later phasing with the learnings from the early phases. And the way to do that is to get it up and get it running with the cameras. And so I'm very, I'm, I, we need to understand what the cost impact is, but if it's a matter of pay me now or pay me later, I just as soon pay it now and get the benefit and get the learnings that will help us down the road. Uh, lastly, um, I, I don't have any interest in talking about additional phases until we see staff come back to council with a recommendation for what the phases after phase three are to be. Really honestly, there wasn't much interaction on that. It was mainly the engineers and the experts that you know, looked at traffic volumes and decided what the phases ought to be. And I'm sure there was a lot of other technical expertise that was put to bear on that. I don't mean to demean that. But I do want council to have a view of what the remaining phases are. And I'd like that view established not just on traffic volumes, but on congestion, measures of congestion, as well as safety and emergency access. I would like those criteria included in addition to traffic volumes. And so before we do any more planning for any more phases after phase three, I'd like to have a chance for council to put its oar in the water about what the additional phasing should be and the timing of those phasings, including whether we have two phases instead of six and that sort of thing. So I, I, I really am making that request. I'd like to see that happen. Thank you. Okay. I'd just like to remind the council that as part of the general plan, we've got a lot of intersection improvements that are in the general plan that will help these critical intersections as well as the traffic synchronization. So there's a whole laundry list of those that we'll be addressing. I just don't want to be a Cessna. I want to be a 747. <laughs> so yeah. please make it a good test. Okay. Any other comments or questions of staff? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Faust. Um, any public comment on this item? Seeing none, any comments from the public on non-agenda items? Seeing none, we're uh, uh, recessed to closed session. <laughs>